This channel is part of the History Hits Network. Is it good news? In the early 1900s, our sailing boats traded across the globe. Dead ahead, 80 yards. And our fishing fleets fed the nation. It's a time that we often look back on with nostalgia. In it comes, in it comes, quickly. Herring, brilliant boys. But what was it like for everyday communities who made their living from the sea? Four modern day families are heading back over a hundred years to the start of the 20th century. Oh gosh, look. To live for a month as a small fishing community on the wild, exposed coast of Anglesey. We're about to embark on the adventure of a lifetime. One hand you're thinking it's pure magic, it's beauty. The next minute you're carrying out five kids' worth of pee. In a time of hand-to-mouth existence. At the moment, we're skint. What are you looking for? I want something to eat. Of hard physical graft. I'm not gonna lie, I can think of easier ways to make a living. Both at sea. Keep coming, it's caught. Rip it, rip it. And at home. I am going to make lunch, I am going to wash your clothes, and I am going to make some bread. And then I am going to go cockling as well. The families will have to come together to help each other. We just wanted to extend our love to you. Will they fall in love with the past, or will they fall apart? This is our end now, isn't it? This is actually our end. On the 1900 island. I'm not giving up for a second, not a chance. We smashed it. The beautiful tidal island of Llanwyn off the coast of Anglesey in North Wales. A remote location jutting out into the Irish Sea. No one has lived here for the past 70 years, but all that's about to change. Just a few miles up the coast, four families with a passion for the past and a longing to escape the demands of the modern world are about to spend the next month living as a 1900 fishing community. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. The Davis family of seven are from the Wirral near Liverpool. Yay. They are 39-year-old mum, Natalie, 40-year-old customer services manager, Gavin, and their five children. My three times great grandfather was a labourer in a fishing community just up the coast from Anglesey. I think the transition from nine five office worker to the harsh realities of a fisherman's existence. How I would cope with that, I honestly don't know. I always say, if I could just go back in time, just for a small time, if I could just have a little look at what it was like, what it was like to wear those clothes and things like that. I think I just want to wear a corset. Wow, we went going out. Powers are a Welsh-speaking family of five from Cardiff. It's a dozen, eh? Their 40-year-old qualified accountant, Lydia, her 36-year-old husband, sports development officer and leader in their church, Gareth, and their three children. I think there'll be beauty in the simplicity mm. of the experience of life back then. From the age of 10 to 18, I lived in a little village called Llansaint. It wasn't unusual for us to go cockling and have supper that evening of fresh cockles. It is such a unique opportunity to get, get back to maybe some of the, the core basics. 
and, and think and reassess priorities in life. History Hit is like Netflix, just for history fans, with exclusive history documentaries covering some of the most famous people and events in history, just for you. We work with some of the world's best historians, like Susanna Lipscomb, Mary Beard and Tony Robinson, exploring everything from the jobs of Tudor England to the diaries of Queen Victoria. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you can't find anywhere else. Sign up now for a 14-day free trial and Absolute History fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY at checkout. Oh, 38-year-old yeah. geography lecturer Kate Evans and 34-year-old blacksmith Arwell John are a new couple from Swansea. I would love to get out in the fishing boats and have a go. The reality is I'm not sure that that was what women were able to do in that period. Arwell's lived off-grid for several years. I'm a practical guy, so I'm more than happy to, to sleep rough in the woods. And lots of my friends have gone, oh, when the zombies come, you're, we're going to knock on your door, you're going to be leading our team of survivors because you've got the skills, Arwell, it's going to be great. And the final family, a retired couple, 70-year-old Clive Barker and his 68-year-old wife Cheryl from Kent. People of our age don't get this sort of opportunity very often. I think it's a massive thing to be able to do. They've been married since 1968, and back then, Clive worked as a fisherman. I was fishing at Whitstable. I was there for probably nearly five years, I suppose. Looking back on it, I really enjoyed it. It was just, um, it was a very fulfilling way of life. As the families near the island, the conditions turn. An Atlantic weather front, Storm Alley, is sweeping in from the southwest. <laughs> Heading for Sandwin, with winds gusting up to 80 miles an hour. Well, this is a glimpse of the next four weeks, isn't it? Absolutely speechless. stunning. It is just yeah. completely speechless. Yeah. You walk up and have a look. Arlo. Oh gosh, look. <laughs> Welcome home. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, you got your name on it. Wow. Yeah, look. Oh. It's the powerhouse. It's the powerhouse. <laughs> Davis is on the end. End of terrace. All the wind. Oh, yeah. <laughs> These four cottages, a boat shed on the beach, and a community hall which doubles up as a tavern and school, will be home for the next month. Hello. <gasps> oh, my goodness. The Davis family are in cottage number one. It's a bit on the grim side, isn't it? Is it about your bed? Yeah. Gav? Yeah. <laughs> For Gavin and Natalie, 15-year-old Ruby, Lily, 13, Jude, 9, Evan, 4, and 2-year-old Arlo, this will be a squeeze. Do you play the rocking horse? Oh, my goodness, that's steep. Be careful, bud. Please be careful. In 1900, it was common for parents and children to share rooms <laughs> and even beds. Oh, it's going to get cold in here, get wrapped up. For the Davises, hardship isn't completely unknown. The toughest period we've been through as a family, I lost my job. OK, two hands. OK, we've got to get right over. That's it. We couldn't put food on the table for the kids. We were on the verge of food banks. Yeah. We were getting calls from our mortgage provider, yeah. credit card companies. And then on top of that, Natalie was pregnant. It really was awful. I feel like we're just coming out of it now. But there's always that niggle and doubt in the back of your mind that it, you know, it could happen again. And it can happen to anybody. We, we never thought it would happen to us. 
Spacious. This is home. Next door Ready? are Kate and Arwell. Main bedroom. Ooh, yeah. We've been together just over a year now. No, you, a year and a half? year and a half, something like that. Something like that. Well, do you want a cup of tea, then? We don't have children. We don't have any ties in that respect at the moment. Pantry. Living the life of a new couple in the 1900s means their cottage is sparse with few possessions. Well, the first thing that struck me was seeing my name on top of the door, the Johns. Yeah. Uh, so, that's so in a way, I'm deleted out of that. And so, more than likely, we actually probably would have had to get married. Just, just to live together? Just, just to live yeah. in a community like this. I mean, it's not a big place. I think it'll be interesting to see how the, the freedoms I'm used to now as a 21st century woman will be different. But yeah. if, if it's the John household, then I'm the boss. Oh, mm. Mm. Wow. Oh, OK. In cottage number three are the powers. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my dear cramp. Cramp. An incredible way to stay. Lydia and Gareth's children a seven year old Phoebe, five year old Dav, and Griff, who's just two. So, my hen, my tan, Phoebe's a Dav, a Griff, my tan, a minvenin. So, Phoebe's a Dav. Their 1900 home is a world away from their three-bed suburban semi. I think for, for the children, it's going to be a massive change, uh, a massive adjustment for them. I guess they don't fully understand what it is that we're, we're leading them into. This is where you wash your hands every day. What do you think of our fibs? There's no tap, there's not any water. It's basic, but it's... it's on sweet. <laughs> I would hate to go there and just be on my own in the house. I'd love to say, come on, come over to mine, or I'll come over to yours. I would love for us women within that community to do things together. Oh, wow. wow this is... And in cottage number four are the Barkers. Oh, it's lovely. It's lovely. It's nice, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's pretty big, isn't it? Yeah. Knitting wool. Oh, it's all there, look. Oh. Scissors. Yeah. As the oldest family, Clive and Cheryl's home reflects a lifetime of acquiring possessions and skills. If anyone's cold, I can knit them a shawl. I can knit and I can sew. And if anyone needs their children looked after, then I can do that as well. <laughs> the Barkers own three children have long since flown the nest, and along with their eight grandchildren, are spread across the world. We love them. We don't see enough of them. I'd like to see them more, obviously. But uh, it's great when we see them. It'd be really good to be as part of a bigger big, community, big community yeah. and to help each other. I could see us sitting here at night, mm. playing cards and... Pipe, clay pipe. You don't smoke. <laughs> I might take it out for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> Ruby, have you seen your knickers? <laughs> it's time to strip away the last vestiges of modern day life. Watch. I'm assuming I'm not going to keep the watch. As the families remove their 21st century clothing. Right, dive in. And put on their 1900 attire. <laughs> Oh, it's my it's my knickers. I just realised. Oh, not only knickers. These are Cratchit's knickers. Free traders, they used to call. So I can pay you standing up. <laughs> but not everyone's finding it quite so amusing. Come see them in half fever. Men itchy. Men eating cravy. <laughs> The clothing would have been homemade, from rough wool, for warmth and durability, but not necessarily for comfort. Well, Griff's drachan or tea. We're having a drachan cute. <laughs> the men's clothes aren't that different from today. Thank you from a bad boy band of fishermen. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a world apart for the women. Right. Nah. Right. Nah, 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 nah. 
They have to wear up to 13 items of clothing, which can weigh well over a stone. They've got jackets as well. This, this is my blouse. It's not a jacket. I haven't got my skirt on yet. Really? No. <laughs> I thought that was it. At the back here, those buttons can be undone. That's good. And it makes a full dress. Well, that's good. I like that. You really love the top. Does it look good? You look amazing. <laughs> As a stormy dusk settles over the island, the families shelter in their cottages, preparing for their first night. Come on, Dad. Watch out, now we're going to burn ourselves. Stand here for me. Go on. Go on. Yes. The stove is the heart of the 1900 home and needs to be kept alight day and night. It's their only source of heat, hot water and cooking. Just needs gentle encouragement here and there. That's all it needs. You just need to kind of know how these things work. Good God, you need to do this early, because I can't see now. That's just what I thought. And with no electricity, the families will have to rely on candles and lanterns. Ah, you time for bed. <laughs> <laughs> It's the start of day two, and Storm Alley is still pounding the UK coastline. The waters near Thandwind were once described by Admiral Nelson as one of the most treacherous stretches of sea in the world. And with gale force conditions today, fishing is out of the question. With no mod cons, just keeping on top of home life is work enough. They have to brave the elements to use the toilets, get coal, and fetch water from the one standpipe serving all four cottages. It's like an amazing morning. One, one hand you're thinking it's, it's pure magic, it's beauty. The next minute you're carrying out five kids' worth of pee. Who wants to clean the chamber pots? Not me. Right, are we ready to get you dressed? Mm. Good boy. We can go outside then, can't we? Yeah. Whoa. The little ones just slept right through. But it was it was windy, it was noisy, and that was scary at times, wasn't yeah, it? Was yeah. it? But it's so dark. Yeah, it just really black, isn't is it? just it's black. You just couldn't see a thing. The waves look really rough, so. I don't think the men will be venturing out on any sailboats today, which I think is a really nice thing, actually. I think it'll be nice to have Gareth around the home just as we settle in and to help settle the kids. OK. Matt? Yes? What did you want to wash these dishes in? A bowl or...? Yeah, just something big enough for a bucket or a bowl or...? There's got to be a better way of doing all this, surely. It's hand soap. That's your washing up. Do you know what did I say your? I didn't notice that. What's that all about? <laughs> I love you, girl. In 1900, women and girls were responsible for all domestic chores, but not every household's following the social norms just yet. Oh, isn't Daddy good? Look how Daddy's got a fire roaring. It looks brilliant. As well as adjusting to male and female roles, the modern families will have to live frugally. In 1900, families tried to save money and stockpile provisions to survive lean times. Oh, you want me to help, Mum? I don't know. I don't know what it is. Each family has been given a small amount of cash and food. 
you have to put, like, and that's got a bone in it. <laughs> With rationing, it should see them through the first couple of days. Vegetables, Veg, milk, milk, apples. We've got cheese, we've cheese, got butter, butter lard. lard. They also have a small vegetable patch to supplement any fish they catch. Have you gone? Yeah. But with the storm still raging and fishing too dangerous, they'll have to manage their limited supplies and cash very carefully. In 1900, 60% of the weekly budget went on food. I had a look at what was in the house already, and if I do this today, I can top it up and keep it going tomorrow, and then we can just add stuff to it. It's lovely looking out and seeing the children running yeah, by. It's it's so nice. nice. Yeah. For 70 year old Clive, life's less carefree. He's developed a case of gout. Just burning. It's a recurring illness he's had for years. This is where the problem is on the ball of the foot here. If you touch it, it's very hot. The big toe here is very swollen, oh, and it's yeah. now spreading to those yeah. two. You can't put your foot on the ground, it's so tender. I can't really get a shoe on at the moment. With modern medicine, Clive's gout can be managed. But at the start of the 20th century, minor illnesses could easily become fatal. Life expectancy was shockingly low. 48 years for men and 52 for women. It's extremely painful, and he really needs to be sitting with his foot up, but he won't. So, yes, I do worry about it. It's bad timing for the Barkers. In 1900, there was no formal social support. Until Clive's condition improves, he won't be able to fish, to eat or sell. Look at these waves. Oh, yeah. Whoa! Kids, don't go too far. When the fishing families of 1900 were stormbound, the men would take whatever manual labor was available. While their wives often had second jobs to supplement the family income. It's a flower, and there's lard in there as well. Keen home baker Natalie will run the village bakery. I haven't got a clue what I'm doing. This is different to any bread I've sort of made before. I just don't really have a clue what I'm doing. As a qualified accountant, Lydia's bookkeeping skills will help her run the small shop. Cheryl, potatoes, bacon and pears. OK, that's great. Yeah. The Barkers will use the community hall to run a tavern in the evenings. Can you work out how many tots in a bottle? Yeah, 25 tots, I expect, if you really mean. And for Arwell, who grew up on a farm, and his partner, Kate, there's a flock of chickens. <laughs> Apart from fish, <laughs> eggs are one of the only other sources of protein readily available on the island. Hello, Merged. Oh, loads. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine eggs. At a penny each in 1900 prices, eggs were a valuable commodity. We're made. We're fine. I think the people who've got the best deal here would be Arrowhead and Kate with all the eggs. Because the, the thing is, the, the level of profit isn't massive in the shop. I'm getting 10% profit, which is tiny. They're getting 100% profit. I think everybody's money may end up funneling their direction. <laughs> Even if we're hungry, even if we're tired, we've got to maintain the unity of the community because that's our, uh, that's key. Yeah. That's yeah. key to us all flourishing here, yeah. I think. We're not going to collect eggs. There are eggs. Oh, you mean. As a community or as a team, you know, if we start to fragment, then we're in, uh, yeah, we're in trouble. Then. We're in trouble, so that can't, uh, yeah. that can't happen. As day three dawns, the sea is still too rough to fish. The 
families are down to their last three meals. But that doesn't seem to bother Cheryl. We're having <coughs> porridge, followed by bacon, eggs, and fried bread. In the Davis house, with seven mouths to feed, the mood is very different. Who's hungry? Me. Everything worries me. Everything worries me and everything keeps me awake at night. How much food we have. You know, are their bellies full enough going to bed? No. Just what make so you give the kids the best and we just pick up the scraps and we'll, like, fry up the fat, the rind, and we'll eat the rind. Yeah, can you make sure you're eating, please? I will do, yeah. I just tighten my corset, feel a bit hungry. <laughs> just tighten it a bit and that gets rid of it. Hello? Hello. Oh, hello. Who's this? My name's Joe. I'm your shipwright. Joe Ormond has over 20 years' experience as a boat builder, and he'll be working in the boat shed on the beach for the next four weeks. So you're going to be working on your own down there? Have you got some help? I'll be on my own most of the time, I think, yeah. but I will. there will be days when I'll need another set of hands. You know. right. Throughout this era, shipwrights were to be found in most of the fishing villages dotted around the coast. Yeah, I guess you guys will all be out trying to find food and fishing and... Predominantly, yeah. yeah. Not today, though, eh? No, not today. If the weather's like this and we can't get out to sea, then he said there might be a bit of work for us to do, so we get down there and earn a few bob, I suppose. Hopefully he pays well. Oh, I saw, Above the minimum wage. <laughs> I do a lot of uh, iron work. Are you the blacksmith? I'm a blacksmith, yeah. yes. OK, that might be quite uh, handy. Arwell's skills could be just what Joe needs. So, is this all the stuff you got? Do you want to hand carrying it down? Or? Oh, you give me a hand, carrying the bag down, that'd be nice. Yeah. I'm sure we can work something out between us. Yeah, no, that'd be good. Office workers Gareth and Gavin have missed out on an opportunity. It's great fetching everything, and I like keeping the stove going and all that, but I'm itching to get on a boat now. I feel like I need to contribute something. Other than fetching water and keeping things hot. When you've got the weather against you at home, it doesn't make any difference, just hop in the car and go to the shops. Here, it's so much stops you. Our main income's going to be gav fishing. That in this weather, it's just not going to happen. Oh, I, need, I need to back it. So you, you, you only put it close to the nail so it just takes the bounce out of it. Oh, OK, yeah. you're not, right, gotcha. So if I, if I nip along there, drill yep. those... OK. I mean, have you been out in this, this kind of weather, or...? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, would you go out there? I probably would, but... Would you? Not, not far. I don't think you'd last long out there. When will I know when it's safe? When it's nice and flat and there's no wind. <laughs> the look at the raw power that nature is unbelievable, but at the same time, it's so frustrating because we can't get out there as fellas and provide for our families. We know that all our money is out there and we're stuck on shore, unable to get anywhere near it. And it is a little bit. I'm starting to do my head in. You alright, son? Today was the last of the meat. I've got just over half a dozen eggs. I've just got to wait for the men to go out in the boat. The kids had a little bit of a wobble before they fell asleep, and Phoebe started crying and said, Mommy, I don't like it, I want to go home. It's a new day, and overnight, the storm has finally blown itself out. After three days of no fishing and food supplies running desperately low, 
At last, there's a welcome sight on the horizon. I can see a boat, and it is heading this way. It's getting bigger, which means it's getting closer. So I can only assume that's ours. George, can you tell your dad the boat's uh, on the way in? A fishing vessel's been spotted off the coast. <laughs> and is heading for Llanwyn. It's calm everywhere I can see, even out in the, in the rough part yesterday. That's looking pretty flat. So I'm just getting quite excited now. I'm going to go out fishing. First time. It's going to be good. I am feeling like it's first day at school. Yeah. So the nerves are starting to kick in. You know, it's a little bit strange. Because I have no experience at all of, of fishing whatsoever. Just please, anything today. If there's anything you can... I don't want any, like, I don't care if you're, how much you're wretched, how much you're sick, please bring home fish. Yeah, we yeah, I am. I'm, gonna, I'm really going to go really for it. We really need it for everyone. I am going to go for it. He'd better come back with a decent catch, because those kids are hungry, really, really hungry. They're really struggling now. One of the fishing boat crew is on his way to pick up the men. It's time to say goodbye. Do you want goodbye, Daddy? Yeah. Just that. Can I touch the tigers? Good job. Yeah. 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 Of course I'll be safe. I'll be absolutely fine. You're now more worried than I am. Fishing was a dangerous job. In 1901 alone, more than 2,500 people drowned in UK waters, and almost every British fishing community contained families who'd lost loved ones at sea. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I think we're just the teacher, do you, okay? Yeah, well. I think we're just the teacher, it. I just hope they can go on there and be heroic, you know, pulling out fish after fish rather than slipping around and falling on my backside. Ta-da! I am excited, I'm looking forward to it, but it is a step into the unknown, and I think I am going to be very far outside of my comfort zone. The men are going out to sea in a nobby, a type of fishing boat first used in the early 1800s, and one that was found along the west coast of Britain, from Cardigan Bay up to the Scottish border. Yeah, and you can use these lines now, push the two boats together as you stand up, and then you can step up into here. Okay, one, Nobbies two, like this didn't have engines. They relied on sail power, and fishermen had to be as good okay. at sailing as they were at fishing if they were to survive. Hi, so we've got Gavin. Yeah. Oh, well. Gareth. Huh? Gareth. Gareth. Nice to meet you. Right, Gareth, Gavin and Arwell have no real sailing knowledge, so Stuart Gibson, a sailor with over 30 years of experience, is skipper. Nice and calm, bit of breeze, good to learn, and more importantly, I think, good to go fishing. And Mickey Beachy's in charge of fishing. The fishing industry is probably the most, or one of the most dangerous industries you can, you can involved in. Mickey's been fishing along the Welsh coast since he was eight and is now a professional fisherman. That's why I was telling these boys they're going to concentrate on what they're doing. Okay. It's a tough industry, doesn't matter what era you're in. In 1900, life jackets were virtually unheard of and many fishermen couldn't swim. Those that fell overboard often drowned. If we have uh, someone overboard, we do actually need to um, put out our distress. The men are wearing modern life jackets on top of their traditional clothing as the only concession to the 21st century. Throat up first, pulling both together. Go, Gav. Go, Gav. Nice. Nice one, Gav. Good boy, Gav. I just thought that means so. You did. See that? Well, I'm knackered. <laughs> that was amazing. The men are heading out into deeper water, where mackerel tend to feed at this time of year. Okay, the staysail is still pushing us around. Now you can let the staysail go on this one. 
keep it straight now. And we want to be heading towards the far land. OK. Three miles out, and it's time to start fishing. Have any of you boys seen anything like this before? Only little kits for crabbing. You've seen the uh, seaside shops. Right, OK. Today, the men will be using a very simple hand line. So basically, you've got your frame that obviously, as, it's, as you can see, you've got a leaded weight at the end, and then you've got a series of hooks. As you can see, they're tied up with a feather, right? Once in the water, the feathers look like small sand eels, tempting bait for mackerel and herring. I'll put the line out first now, so you can see what's happening. Traditionally, a net would have been used alongside the hand lines, but Mickey's decided to take the training one step at a time. You just feed in your line out slowly like that. Give it a tug, because you may hit mackerel straight away. Finding fish is a mix of hard graft and good luck. They hope to hit a shoal, which could be near the surface or deeper down. When you catch something, this is what you're going to feel. OK. OK? Yeah. Happy with that? Just give it a whirl. I will be watching them closely to see that they're doing it right. Hopefully, by the end of four weeks, they will all be able to cope on their own. And when they get that first catch, it'll be like, all the Christmases come at once. But first, they have to learn to cope with the swell. I'm fishing and holding me breakfast in. Untangle that. Multitasking. Particularly Gareth. Those are fine. Let the line go again. And let's get uh, some fish in then. In 1900, mackerel was in plentiful supply. Tight lines, boys, is what they say. And it wasn't uncommon to land a thousand fish in a day. There's nothing on there. We'll persevere for that one, just keep going. Nowadays, fishermen still rely on trial and error, but with much reduced fish stocks, they also have modern tools like sonar to increase their chance of catching. But living as 1900 fishermen means that Mickey and the men have to rely on their wits and experience alone. We've now reached the point where this is the real hand-to-mouth existence. So it, it's pride, really. I don't want to go back empty-handed. Come on, there must be something in here. Seeing the kids uh, having full plates and full bellies and, and sleeping without that, that rumbling going on. So, yeah, it's, it's of huge importance. Whoa, there's nothing else. There's just nothing. I know, I know, I know, I know. I know. Should we go and have some carrot? No. That's all we keep eating, having bits of raw carrot. I don't know whether he's going to be back for tea. I don't know whether he's going to be back before the kids go to bed tonight. No idea. Gav came back with a, a real big catch, that'd be amazing. I think that would boost his confidence, I think that'd make him feel better, because he hasn't really been able to do anything like that yet. And we, we really need it, we really need it to eat. As the weather takes a turn for the worse, the men are relying on traditional oil skins to keep them dry. This is more like it. This is proper fishing. What are we doing, Gar? Oh, a little bit rough, to be honest. A little bit queasy. And now the swell is increasing. Focus on that horizon. That's what I'm trying to do. It's not really working. Let's have a bloody look here. Yeah. See if there's any bloody fish here. After four hours out at sea, they still haven't caught a single fish. 
Research shows that UK fish stocks have fallen by 94% since 1889. Back in 1900, you wouldn't have had the, the, the big sort of factory trawlers that suck up shoals of mackerel in one go with so all sorts of technology to, to a system that they've got these days. It's the sign of the times, I'm afraid. This is the right way. Incredibly frustrating at the moment. I think we had visions of um, dragging a load of fish in so we can make some money, but right now, it doesn't seem the luck's with us. It only goes to show how precarious the life of a fisherman can be. OK, boys, we're going to get the lines in. Unfortunately, we haven't caught anything. So bear in mind the bad weather coming towards us. So we'll try and move ahead of it and make our way in. It's a shame it is, but what I'm most not looking forward to is going back to the village now empty-handed. I'm disappointed we haven't caught any fish. I am liking the thought of going home. <laughs> <laughs> The whole community will rise and fall on how we do on the boats. We're all in this together. We've all got to work together to make this work so that our community back home can thrive and be well fed. Up to see them. I hope it's good news. I hope they've got loads of fish with them. Excited! I'm so excited. See what fish he's got. Apprehensive. I mean, they're late back. That may be a good sign. Are you hungry? Yes. Oh, it's staying that way. Is it? Not one fish. Really? Yep. Nothing all day. Nothing at all. Do you not get anything? Are you going to get that? No, nothing. Ooh, you're out there all day. You carry on. Carry on. Carry on moving forward. Come on. Carry on. With no catch, the families will have to make their remaining supplies stretch even further. I'm just, I'm just so sorry I've not been able to bring anything back. Because we're all dreading coming back because we've been talking about having fish to sell, fish to eat, to come back with absolutely nothing after putting in so much effort is a killer. I think back in modern day life, we're very much paid for our time. You know, we're paid for a sick day, we're paid for holidays. We've now got no earnings for what has been a lot of effort. So the, the contrast between then and, and now is huge. He's massively proud of, you know, providing for his family. So, yeah, this will this will hit him hard. So it's got to be just, it's fine, it's moved over. Another day, and with the sea once again too rough to use the boat, the women decide to try their luck on shore instead. They're going cockling. It's lovely to get out, actually. I haven't seen the island yet, so it's really nice to see her out. The cockle beds on the mainland near Llanwyn have been worked since pre-Roman times. The nearest is just over a mile away, 
And while the tide's out, they can walk there. You're looking for the wet sand where the tide's gone right out and there's a tiny bit of water left. I think, let's walk around there and see if the sand's different over there. No idea what I'm doing. I'm following the lead completely. Cockles live in the sand, filtering seawater for nutrients. They were particularly popular in the early 1900s and fetched a good price at market. What's the new clues that came on to us? Yeah, I'm a fighting well a spurt. Ah, oh, look, a spit. Look, look, look. Look. Oh, oh. There's loads of spits. You've got to get in quickly. As the cockles burrow down, they often spit out sand, a telltale sign of their location. You make it my way. Some of them would chuck it all in. See, see all those bubbles? Traditionally, they're raked up and passed through sieves that allow the small ones to drop back onto the beach. This is nothing. I can see, you know. Nothing. I just feel like we're wasting time. Here we are, there's bubbles here. A rich cockle bed can contain more than a million cockles per acre. As long as you know where to look. We found it, did it? Nope, nothing. Oh, oh man. man! It's really hard. Oh, Natalie, your face says it all. Yeah, cold, wet. Are you cold? Yeah. You know, when I think of my village, it was a half a mile walk down to the beach. We all knew where the cockles were, well, they all knew. And that information was handed down generation to generation. So you knew where to go. And it was a matter of just scooping up bags and bags full of cockles. And it didn't take, it didn't take all day. <laughs> The women have been out for hours, and it's in danger of being another fruitless journey. Lydia, it's a mussel bed. Huh? Mussels. Mussels? Here, yeah. Mussels weren't worth as much as cockles in 1900. You know what you think? I reckon we can almost fill your basket with these, don't you? Yeah but could be sold as bait to fishermen. So they're very dirty, but they'll clean off, so... Yes! We were all starting to feel a little bit dejected. We just sort of thought, another wasted trip. But um, we're going home with something. I think they should be pretty impressed. Yeah. Yeah. Coming in fast. It is coming in. Okay, let's get down. Yeah. With a good haul of mussels, now word can be sent to the local fishmonger. Well, we went to the limit today, didn't yeah. you? But we kept going and we found. And now I need a cup of tea and a pea, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Day six, and there's lots of work to be done if the community is to make the most of the fishmonger's visit this afternoon. Oh, you women are amazing. I know they're horribly messy and they're going to take a hell of a lot of cleaning, but we can do that. Yeah, it's a bit of a personal challenge for us all. More I know the tune. Yeah, I know the tune. Gathered in the Davis house, all but one of the families are hard at work, preparing the mussels. It is easy if you go down from that end down. I think so, yeah. It's a labour-intensive job, but the cleaner the mussels, the higher their value. Hello, see you later. Ta-da! <laughs> 
While the rest of the community work on the muscles, Arwell has his own plans. For the past few days, he's been assisting Joe, the shipwright, hoping to earn some extra wages. Hiya, Joe. Hello. Oh, well. OK? Did you have for breakfast, then? An egg. Just an egg. An egg. But, yeah, could, right. I, could have done with another one. There's something you might want to have with your eggs. Oh, Tomorrow good morning. Man. Straight out of my garden. Dug last night in the rain. They taste really good. Oh, thank you very much. And I got you some, some apples. Oh! It's to say thanks for the help. Phil. Well, thanks, Joe. That's really good. One last thing. Some peppercorn. Oh. Yes, I'm going to give you a hug for that. <laughs> That's good. That is amazing. So enjoy. Nice one, Joe. Cheers. Well, thanks for your help. Excellent. Cheers. Draw. It's a great boost for the Johns. Good news. Oh, amazing. So, cooking apples, they said they're good for stewing. Yeah. But best of all, I think this looks like Christmas. Oh, it's oh, pepper. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I even gave him a hug. <laughs> In the 1900s, pepper was a highly valued spice and would have been a luxury for the working classes. It was often referred to as black gold. Good job, Mr. John. Die young. They were excellent, really pleased with that. I've got a few jobs I want to get done down in the boatyard, but I'll, I'll come back up as soon as I can then. Okay. Um, what, what job? What do you do down the boatyard then, huh? Um, well, yesterday we stuck all the ribs uh, into the boat. How was he paying you? Food. The food, yeah. So, got the pepper this morning. That's expensive. Oh. Yeah, which has made my day. I'm, I'm really chuffed with that. Do you have uh, enough to share it, Nicole? Uh, check with Kate. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not being funny here, but you're down at the boatyard getting something. We're here preparing these, and you're going to benefit from this, so we all need to benefit. You know, we need to share everything, don't we? You will share what you've got when you are. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm happy to share, yeah. Yeah. But I've no idea how much we've got. I do feel a little bit bad that I've got all the pepper. I'm in such a good mood that I've mentioned it to everyone, basically, everyone that I've seen, uh, and I think a lot of people are getting a little bit jealous about that. You can't have one person taking everything and the other sort of starving at their feet, you know. You all have to share. I could share it, or I could just sell it. Uh, I could just keep it all to myself. We all chip in, we all give whatever we're not yeah. using. It might be a good bartering tool, and if I can calm someone down by going, yeah, here's a, here's a corn and pepper, shut up. It might be a bit useful. I'll check with Kate first, because she's looking after all the food, but it would be nice to share some of that wealth around, if possible. After six days of rough weather, finally the sun's out. And it looks as though the better weather has boosted community morale. Kate and Arwell have decided to give some of their food to their neighbours. We're sharing, that's the whole point. I mean, we are all trying to share. Without being unkind, they just needed a little nudge. That was all. So, and I said, <laughs> and I felt awful afterwards, uh, having yeah, said yeah. it. I did feel terrible, <laughs> but there we are. It's done, it's cleared the air, it's, um, and we've got the apples. That's the main thing, we've got the apples. <laughs> <laughs> so the fishmonger is on his way and I'm really hoping he gives us a good price for the mussels we collected yesterday because that was, that was hard work. We're all cut to ribbons with uh, scraping all the barnacles off and everything. Yes. It's a very big moment. It'd be our first, first earnings. outside income. We can stock up with a few basics again. 
bit of bacon. Pay my tab in the shop as well. Yeah. <laughs> Mike Heard, the fishmonger, comes from the nearby town of Carnarvon. He's the fourth generation of his family to run the business. Hello there. Hi. Hello. 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 Good, good. Mr. Hurt, I'm We've got some mussels. Are they any good? They're delicious. Fre fresh. 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 The best you'll Fresh find. when? When did you pick them? Yesterday. Yesterday. Alongside running the household finances, it was traditional for the women, also known as fishwives, to deal with the fishmonger. We've, we've cleaned them and we're all up ready for you. And Lydia's been nominated by the families to be chief negotiator. So, there's no barnacles on them. No barnacles. And we've, we've picked out all the small ones, so they should all be a good size for you. Really plump and full, full of meat, shell. were they? Full of meat. Full of meat. Absolutely full. The yeah. nicest mussels I've ever tasted. What do you think? You haven't put stones in the bottom to make the weight up, have Not you? at all. Not at all. Are you sure? You can pour them out into another bucket you can if you tip like them to into test. Your, a bag, whatever. Well, we'll tip them into a sack and we'll see how much is in the sack. Okay, great. Okay. Yes. Okay. What would they call that? Third of a sack? Half. Oh. Oh. Half a sack there. Half. Well, you've got to tie the top oh, off. You yes. can't do that. Half there. Half. Half. Half a sack. Definitely. I'd say a third. No, it's much more than a third. Well, for this time, because it's your first time, we'll pay half a sack. Can we do just over? No, 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 no. Are we happy Are we all happy on that? That's half fine. a sack, Four yes. Half a sack, wonderful. Yeah. Do you know this? I usually pay five. Do you know what? As the sun is out, and you're clearly impressed with our first catch, we'll go for six a sack, and we'll take the three of you today. <laughs> and it's lovely. Oh! <laughs> it's lovely doing business with you. For the families, it's finally payday. But after two days of hard graft, they've only managed to earn nine pennies per household. The equivalent in modern day money of just three pounds. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Although after a week of nothing, it's a sweet success. That is a great income from those mussels. I think the children are after getting some bonbons from the, the power shop. Um, I think Gav has already spent it in the pub tonight. Seven, eight, nine. This will get every Clive, open that bar up quickly while they're holding cash. <laughs> <laughs> For me? What's the best thing for us to spend it on? You know, yeast and things like that, so I can carry on baking bread. 90 each. 90 each? Yeah. Great, thank you. That's good. To have the cash in our hands, it was worth it. Yeah, great. Next time. Come on, boys, pull them in. The men hit the seas again. Oh. There's someone on that. And get their first taste of success. Yay! But tension surfaces in the community. Could be our, our big owner and their big owner. Well, I'd, rather it, I'd rather it was our big owner. Yeah, yeah. There needs to be a spirit of generosity amongst the community. What are you looking for? Oh! Because you cannot have children going hungry. And life on the 1900 island gets the better of Gavin. Half a cheese sandwich in 24 hours. Just can't feed ourselves. Simple as that. Morning. Morning, you away? Yeah. The four families were living as a 1900 fishing community on the tidal island of Sandwin off the coast of Anglesey have made it through their first week. Plagued by storms, so far the men have failed to catch a single fish, and only a last-minute haul of shellfish by the women brought in some much-needed cash. But it was far from enough, 
and food rations are once again running low. We can always buy some more raisins and put raisins on top and pick some black. I know, but things are quite pricey. Until your dad brings in a decent catch of fish, I want to just wait, because I don't know how long that money is. We've got, what, 15p left? So I, um, I don't really want to be spending. Yeah. Mother of five, Natalie, and her husband, office worker, Gavin Davis, have struggled to feed their family since they arrived on the island. As a fisherman, not catching anything, first of all, losing a lot of pride over that, because I want to go out and have a successful day and provide for everybody and be on my own family. And um, secondly, just need that sense of achievement. For retirees, Cheryl... I've been out since about 6.15 to collect some mushrooms. And Clive Barker, keeping a tight rein on their purse strings has been a challenge. I've had to do it because we're skin. I've overspent. I've been really bad with my budgeting <laughs> and overspent on everything. You're just living a high life, you know. We were used to gourmet meals, that's what it is. You know, it's a habit you can't break. <laughs> if things are too austere and too hard, you get very downheartened. And it's quite easy to do that, especially if you're not eating well. Life for the Barkers hasn't been helped by a flare-up of gout in Clive's left foot. It stopped him heading out to sea and earning an income. In 1900, I suppose, if you were ill, you'd just take to your bed and, and hope for the best. We wouldn't be around at our age, I doubt, in That's 1900. Thing, no, I think we're well past our sell-by date for 1900. <laughs> <laughs> as well as coping with the day-to-day -day details, the families are also grappling with the bigger questions about how the community should function. Mum of three, Lydia. The thing I miss the most is hot running water. <laughs> and sports development officer and leader in their church, Gareth Power, hope they can use their Christian values to help keep the community together. We've got to remain united no matter what, no matter what differences in personalities. You know, we've just got to get on and we've got to be there for one another and that that is vital to our success. But not everyone shares the same vision. Well, it should be a good day for it today, though. Nice and calm, slight breeze. Blacksmith Arwell John and university lecturer Kate Evans have a different view of communal living, especially Arwell, who spent many years living off-grid back in the 21st century. I'm familiar with this way of living, and I suppose I went through that naivety when I first moved into a, an off-grid community. And the one thing that concerned me early on was the amount of sharing and community spirit going on. Because you still have to make sure you're healthy and well-fed. If you can't look after yourself, then how are you expected to look after other people? It's mid-morning, and offshore, the fishing boat is waiting to take the men out to sea. Mm, come back soon. <laughs> All the families have been finding it hard, but Gavin and Natalie, with their five children, have the most at stake. Natalie, I think she's uh, struggling quite a bit. I'm a bit worried. I don't think she's eating terribly well at all. I think she's so worried that the children aren't getting enough that she's going without food. The need for fish is greater than ever. Food now is getting a little bit scarce. Well, more than scarce. Um, there's literally nothing in. Is this the big day? It's got to be done today. Really has got to we be done. We need fish. Today. We're at the bottom, so we're earning the same as the other houses, but if there's only two of you to feed, then you can be eating like kings. Daddy, get some fish. 
some fish. The men are wearing modern life jackets as the only 21st century concession, and they're back under the watchful eye of skipper Stuart Gibson. Morning, morning. Are you, are you ready to do battle again once more? And professional fisherman Mickey Beachy. Nice bit of exercise in the morning. He's been fishing since he was eight. The reality is they're actually living on what they catch or what they forage and uh, it's a struggle for them. Gareth was seasick on their first fishing trip. I'm hoping I'm going to fare a bit better this time. Otherwise, it could be a long eight hours. I think Gareth, God bless him, he's such a lovely chap and he's mild-mannered. But he just needs to up the ante a bit. Glad you got it, Gareth. Arwell, on the other hand, tends to want to do things his own way. So I'm constantly checking the uh, direction of the breeze. He's a bit, bit uh, alone to himself at times. Because if the breeze is right, we can get the power in the sail and we can move forward. But he's very practical. Seriously, this is so far out of my comfort zone, it's stupid. But Gavin, at the moment, is my number one. So you're not going to pull, you're up on the foredeck. He doesn't back chat. So you're going to be doing other things. He wants to do well for the family and the community and really bust the gut. There's a great feeling amongst the fellas on this boat that it's time for us to step up and provide for him. Last week, they attempted simple handlining. Today, Mickey's teaching them to use the more challenging long line. The glass boys are what they would have used back in the day, so I'm... Hoping that they last, otherwise we're going to lose a long line. The long line sits just above the seabed and will hopefully catch bottom feeders like skate and dogfish. Right, keep your hands up there. They won't know if the line has caught anything until they pick it up at the end of the day. Perfect. They'll be handlining for mackerel and herring until then. I'm always superstitious, so I never say, yeah, we're going to get a good haul until we get out there and actually do it. So, see how we go on. Back on dry land, the women are once again hard at work. It's been non-stop since they arrived on the island, and today is no exception. For the working classes of 1900, every Monday is laundry day. This is their white laundry soap. The women each have a manual to help them. We've got to grate the soap into here. Which includes instructions for making their own washing soap. And then add hot water. Washing powder, as we know it, wasn't invented until 1907. This is when I made earlier, and it's become like... Um, oh, slime. Slime. It is like slime, isn't it? Every garment must be washed individually and in a strict order. I wouldn't want to do my washing every single week on one of these is hard going. Just look at the colour of that. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> Adwell's pants and some socks. Kate's getting to grips with a traditional washing dolly, along with a bucket and mangle. It was the 1900 equivalent of a modern washing machine. <sighs> what a gift for a laundry. Even just a simple little washing machine in that corner. That's my washing machine, a pot. I've cooked food in that this week. <laughs> I'm washing dishes in it, and now I'm washing clothes in it. That's worked well, isn't it? Look how lovely and. Uh... White and shiny, that is. <laughs> Check in that line and drop them down here. Keep moving that line, that. The men have been handlining for over two hours. I'll check this in now, see, see what we've got. But they've yet to get a bite. Come on, boys, pull them in. The pressure's mounting.
Go set up, go. Come on, Gar. Get on the line, boy. One of the big motivations for me coming out here was for my kids to see me doing something meaningful. After being made redundant in 2013, Gavin spent three years struggling to provide for his family. I want them to see me come off the boat with a catch, so they can see that the dad's achieving something. Vicky, hello! I think there's something on here. Ah, oh, balls. Ow! Yeah, it's just really hot, the water. With seven sets of clothes to wash, Natalie still up to her elbows in laundry. Look, it's not even dirty, and things just get put. Do you know how hard it is to wash when it's like this? Not this week. Not this week they're not shoving it in the wash. You're wearing it till it crawls off you. To add to Natalie's frustration, her two daughters, 15-year-old Ruby and 13-year-old Lily, still aren't pulling their weight. They seem to have a lot watching me and nobody helping me. Something that Natalie's all too familiar with in their modern life. I happily do it on the washing machine. Just you have to show me how to do it. But you won't because you've got so many other things to do, so I don't want to bother you when you're doing stuff. It is written <laughs> on the machine <laughs> what to do. It doesn't. It's a spoiled generation that complain about turning on a washing machine. I am going to give you a drink. I am going to make lunch. I am going to give you a drink. I am going to wash your clothes and I am going to make some bread. Oh, how disheartening is that? It's got all rust on it from the mangle. Oh, good God, look at that. It is actually a lot more work than the men, really. I mean, it's a bit of a doddle out fishing, isn't it, if you think about it. <laughs> Clive, who worked as a fisherman in the 1970s, is also having a challenging day. He's bedridden with gout. Clive is desperate to get out in the boats, which is his main passion. I'm sure it'll happen if he can just be patient. It's meant he's missed yet another fishing trip. The toe's still very swollen and it's tender. It's been a long time now, so... It'd be a big relief when it does go. Living in 1900 is proving a massive challenge for all the families. And out at sea, the men are still empty-handed. I've been fishing for a long time, and, you know, you go out there some days and you spend hours and hours on end fishing, and you don't catch anything. It's a world away from the bountiful catches at the start of the 20th century, when in just one day in 1907, 90 million herring were landed near Great Yarmouth. Fish aren't so plentiful these days as they were back then. I think the biggest challenges are factory trawlers or whatever that actually, you know, suck up tons of fish at a time. That's the difference between then and now, and it's a massive contributor to lack of fish being in the ocean. Us as a species, you know, have ruined the seas. It's a sobering reality for all modern fishermen and one that isn't helping the novices who are relying on century old fishing techniques. Oh! Someone on that. Go on in. I haven't felt that before. Hey! hey, hey. That's a mackerel. But I think he's a bit small. We'll measure him. He is actually in size. I think we've got another few yet. Yeah. Hey! So hey. the boys, they're here. I could smell them this morning from the beach. Oh, really? Finally, they've hit a shoal of mackerel. Loads of fish here. 
and can land any over 20 centimetres. A modern day regulation. What you do when you dispatch the back girl is this finger in the mouth, yeah, thumb at the back, stop shaking. Oh, that's oh, what I get. Two, a three. Three. Oh, just to the top, just to the top. Oh. Pleasant to do. It's got to be done under the circumstances. I've got something here, I reckon. Good lad. That's a that's a winner. That's a thrill, that. That's amazing. I told you, didn't I, Gav? That beats anything I've achieved in the last 20 years in an office. I'll tell you that much. Yes, Gav, let's go on. That's the best oh, good out there. it is. Along with the Hall of Mackerel, the long line has also caught some dogfish. We're going to need a bigger boat. Not only is it a great catch, but for Gareth, who spent most of last week's fishing trip being sick, he's finally found his sea legs. I'm looking forward to going back and, and uh, giving him the good news that we've, uh, we've got a haul of fish. It's been a superb day today. I'm chuffed to bits. Go back, head held high, and we smashed it. They look more energetic. Yeah. Oh, please, 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 please. Daddy. Please. Daddy! Since they arrived on the island, storms and inexperience have hampered their progress. But at last, they've got something they can be proud of. Dogfish. 40 mackerel in there. They've caught 44 mackerel and three dogfish. Oh, yeah, well, well done, man. Okay. Look at you. I really are proud of yeah. us. Really, really am. Um... Can I touch it? Touch it. Touch it. Da -da. Can I touch it? Da -da -da -da. No, no, no. Is it it's mackerel go, and dogfish? The fish. I've oh. never seen um, dogfish before. No, me neither. I don't think the dogfish will fetch much money. Clive can deal with them very easily. If, I know you don't like the look of them now. By the time Clive's finished with them, nice you'll have a nice piece little piece of, of white fish, no bone, just cartilage, mm. so the children can eat them. And I think we could all do with it, actually. We could all do with some protein. I think so. I think the kids need the protein. Both in 1900 and today, dogfish aren't regarded as a high-value species, but the families are banking on the mackerel fetching a good price from the fishmonger. Up to everybody yeah. else. Lydia's negotiating. I trust Lydia's Lydia. a negotiator, absolutely. Whatever decision you take, Lydia, I might go and get it. Mike Hurd, a fourth generation fishmonger from nearby Carnarvon, has arrived to see what's on offer. Tell us the prices that you'd normally Well, uh, we'd have to sort them out with small and large. That's small, that. It's a small and mackerel. Small. Yeah. yeah. Would you, do you buy the small ones? Buy the small ones, but not the same price as the big ones, obviously. No. Okay. And what, what kind of price are we looking at? 3p for the small ones. Okay. Three pence each for the small mackerel. Okay. And maybe. Six, six, six for, for the them. medium. Six. Six for the medium and the large, then. I can't see any large, can you? <laughs> <laughs> right. Who's going to get the hands dirty? Save so counting them and messing about. Should we say four and a half? If yeah. everybody's happy with that, then. Yeah. That sounds good to me. Good, okay, good. You've got yourself a deal. Diane. Oh, I'm thrilled with that. Yeah, I'm thrilled with that. It's definitely lifted the spirits now of, of, the, of the whole community. It's lifted the spirits of them all. I feel elated. Everybody's smiling, everyone feels good. It's just the best feeling. Let's have a look. Right, so this one shilling. As was traditional, the money's being divided between everyone on the boat, including Mickey and Stuart, who gets an extra share for providing the fishing vessel. So basically, Stuart, you get 55 double, so 110, and 55 for the other four men. 55 pennies was the average daily wage for a fisherman in 1900. It's up to them what to do with it then and whether to share with uh, Clive and Shero. OK, fantastic. Mackerel's gone. 
And here's our tea. Okay. Clive, who missed out on the fishing today because of his gout, isn't entitled to a share of the earnings. Most people who catch them, bring them around and give them to me because they don't want to do them, so... But as a former professional fisherman, he still has much to offer. Get the fins off first. Don't need the tail. Get... I have no idea how to do this whatsoever, but um, I mean, that's the benefit of having Clive here. Knock out of it. If he wasn't here, we'd probably still be going hungry. There's a bit of meat there, if you want to bother with it, we could do. That's called the belly flap, that bit there. If you take that out, if you can get the skin off of that, you've got a bit more meat, which is quite nice. See, this is exactly the kind of knowledge we need. And this is the reason why we want to give you a share of the take today. Oh, that's very kind of you. I know you're... Well, we all know that you're incapacitated at the moment, but <laughs> all you need to know, Clive, is that we wouldn't have got through this without you and Cheryl, most definitely. So, from me and my family, I'd like to give you a share right, very, um, very kind of, of our much, take. Much appreciated. Yeah, we'll, uh... I'm going to give you that for and I'm going to shake your hand. Oh, thank you very much. All right. And you got dogfish tonight? Dogfish tonight? See you again. Have you prepared that? Dogfish well? tonight for you. Cheers, Clive. Thank you, Gareth. Cheers, uh, was our share for you. Most kind of you. Very kind of you. Oh, God, we're. We were on a roll here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well. <laughs> oh. Uh, Gavin us. Thank Gavin you. us. Give, give us. Sorry. A share. Give us a, a very share. Nice, very isn't nice. It? Yeah. As the sun sets, the family is all tucked into their first fish supper since arriving on the island. What do you think of the fish? Hmm. Mm. Pleasantly surprised. More meaty and cod. Right, here's a bit more meaty than cod. Um, that's nice to you. Did that. My name is Hilo Chickalo, Chickalo Hilo. Oh! <laughs> Seeing them walk up there with a the basket full of fish, yeah. They all did really well today. I'm getting a sense that the 1900 man, it was feast or famine with those guys. If they went out and had a good catch, they got this feeling today. But we've experienced the down times as well where we didn't catch anything. And I'm sure there's testing times ahead. As a new day dawns, the sun's out. But the wind is blowing and the swell is increasing. Fishing is off the cards once again. Fortunately, all the families have a secondary income. I don't think they talk to me. Arwell's checking his chickens to ensure they're healthy and happy. They're making all the right noises and behaving as, as I'd expect. Getting, on average, 11, 11 eggs a day at the moment. At three pennies for four eggs, it's a good earner. Do you have any eggs for sale? Four would be lovely. Four? Yeah. And as one of the few sources of protein on the island, when there's no fish, they're doing a healthy trade. There's only two mouths to feed, so we haven't got to feed the whole family. But we are doing quite well on money. For Lydia, earning a small profit from the shop in her front room is a welcome boost. And today, she's received a grocery delivery. Oh, brilliant. What's in here? Oh, packaging. Oh, that says Cadbury's there, that's Cadbury's. In addition to the basics, there are a few luxury items. Cadbury's cocoa essence. Pure cocoa. Oh. The early 1900s saw a boom in consumerism. Manufacturers began to expand their product ranges and improved transport links brought remote communities within reach. I hope people are ready to spend their pennies. Oh, that's nice. I don't know what that is. Luxury items didn't come cheap. A tin of cocoa was the equivalent of just over half of a fisherman's daily wage. Oh, that smells, that smells pretty good. What do we make with cocoa powder? Chocolate. Yeah. yeah. <gasps> oh, my gosh. Great. Right. 
That's probably like gold dust. Yeah. Right, Marsani! Marsani! Uh, Griff was having a little play with the, the tin and pulled the lid off and spilled it. This is going top shelf straight away. The new products are worth nothing unless Lydia can sell them. I have in some cold cream. Oh, that smells so nice. For the working classes in 1900. <laughs> it just smells so clean. Smelling nice was a luxury few could afford. Yeah, that's one shilling, two pennies. No. Sorry, that is okay. well out of my price range. It's hard, because you have to just sort of look and then walk away and think, no, I don't need any of that. I need meat and sort of like the staples, butter, sugar, lard. Maybe if we have two days of really good catch, then it's a maybe. Um, but at the moment, no. For the Davis family, Natalie's earning extra cash baking bread. Getting quicker, getting better. But with the most mouths to feed and at a meagre penny a loaf, it's not going very far. The 1899 Education Act of England and Wales stated that all children between the ages of 5 and 12 had to go to school. David, I'm not very happy with that shirt. Take it in, please. But truancy was still very common, as children were often needed to work and contribute to the family income. So, children, I want you to have a look at my blackboard here and tell me what is on it. A map. A map of what? The world. The world. So, for your title, could you please write on the top of your boards, the world? In 1905, almost three quarters of primary school teachers in England and Wales were women. Modern day teacher Carrie Morgan Barley comes to teach the children every weekday from 9 till 3.30. What do we get from the West Indies? Sugar. Sugar. And nutmeg, excellent. And what do we get from China? <gasps> David. Tea. Tea. Well done. Sugar. It was only a select minority of women that could get work as a teacher. The majority went into domestic service. S-U-G-A-R. As working class teenagers, Ruby and Lily's education is over. I was thinking to maybe help get a little bit of money in. Mm. Yeah. Maybe you could do the neighbours washing. After you saw me doing it, I didn't see you do it. Mm. Oh, I can't wait, you're really paying attention. While boys over 12 often worked in dangerous manual jobs like yeah, fishing. Ruby and Lily would have been sent to work for wealthier households. You're off that age, you can't just be sat outside watching the children play. You need to be actively working there. Yeah. OK. All right. See you later. All right, see you in a bit. Bye. Love you. Love you. I think she does need to understand that that is what, you know, what girls her age were doing. Doesn't matter what you like. You're going to do, you know, chores. That's it. I like your stitch motion. <laughs> I didn't have to do it. <laughs> Hello. Hello, girls. What can I do for you? Do you have any jobs for us to do? What's your ironing like? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> As the wealthiest household at the moment, the Johns are happy to help the girls out. There you go then, guys. Mm. Yeah. Go crazy. That's my head scarf. Go on. Got it? A century ago, domestic service was Britain's number one employer. It's quite heavy. 
It was normal for young working class girls to do a large household's laundry, ironing and cleaning, as well as helping in the kitchens. I find it in under quite sexist because I can't do the things that the men have to get to do. So it's quite unfair, to be honest. It's annoying. It's taken forever just to do this one shirt. And I'm not even like half done yet. Ugh. <laughs> That's the only word you can use to describe it. Ugh. I'd really want to play outside right now. <laughs> I wonder what they're playing. We got threepence. Well done. No. Well done. Well done, girls. Well done, all of you. For two hours' work, Kate's paid the girls three pennies. That's good. About 50p each in today's money. Was that from the ironing you did, Ruth? Yeah. Yeah. It's a far cry from back home. We're lucky if we can get Ruby out of the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do anything at home, but here I'm doing a lot. Like I'm shattered. Probably as the man of the house, I'd be actually pushing Ruby out the door. So there's one less mouth to feed, telling her to go and work, telling her to find a man. And that's quite a sobering thought when you when you think about it. All you were good for was cleaning and looking after the kids. That was your role in society. I think it's completely stupid. I think yeah. it's just make everything equal for everyone and then everyone will be happy. And that's why I'm proud of you, because that's the attitude you would have needed to fight for your position in the world back then. In the early 1900s, British society was far from equal. Women's rights were limited, and it wasn't until 1918 that women won the right to vote. Dav, do you score one? Yeah. Oh, he's away! Man, we're not too close. Ah. Ah, it's <laughs> It's another day on Llandwyn, and the wind and swell are still putting fishing on hold. I'm hungry. <laughs> You're hungry? Yep. Okay. The Davises are once again tightening their belts. And that's my tea for seven. Seven people. Because we've been what, averaging about 10 eggs a day, um, yeah, it's been about 10 days. It's about nine or 10 eggs a day. With less money coming into the community, Kate and Arwell's egg business is starting to suffer. We could, if we're not careful, end up with a glut of eggs. They're trying to work out a new marketing plan. In the shop, the eggs would retail for a penny each. So the plan is, if we sold them all to Lydia, buy all of the eggs as we get them at Hapney each and then you can sell them for a penny each and you get the profit. And we won't try and sell them on the side or anything like that. This offer would pass all the risk to Lydia and her shop. But Arwell's in two minds. That's a big markup, though. It is a big markup. It could be their big owner. It could be our, our big owner and their big owner. But I'd rather, it, I'd rather it was our big owner. Well, there we are. So that's the, that's the alternative option, is that we keep them ourselves and we just sell them. Yeah. Kate and Adwell are brilliant, and at the end of the day, they're running a business, um, and you know they need income themselves. Everyone is just surprised at the price of eggs, and that is the same price as a loaf of bread. Where Natalie has to put hours of work in to make the bread, whereas an egg you just walk outside, pick it up. Pretty much pure profit. Food in 1900 was relatively more expensive with no 21st century intensive farming techniques. Bread cost up to three times as much as today, while eggs cost 10 times more. 
as long as there's a real spirit of generosity amongst us, then I think the community can continue to succeed. Because you cannot have children going hungry. Aware that there's a growing inequality between the families, Lydia's using her position as shopkeeper to ensure that the orders are fairly distributed. Kate has got both beef and bacon. And rather than tell you your bacon hasn't arrived, I can tell Kate her bacon hasn't, hasn't arrived. Because I'm sure because she's all right, because she's already got beef anyway. Okay. So they're living, they've got loads of meat next door, never they... mind kings. <laughs> oh I know. Don't worry about it. No, we've got bloody twelve eggs a day round next door as well. I know. What are we giving our kids? Absolutely nothing. I know. But we're a big family. It's not the point though, she's charging a fortune. For bloody what did eggs. we have for lunch today? I had an apple core. You had an apple core for lunch? An apple and you worried about them not having enough meat next door? I know, I know. It's just the way it is. I just think it's overpriced and being held to ransom. That's all. I know. But it's, a, it's their prerogative, it's their business. I have to respect that. That's what they want to charge, that's what they want to charge. I just need to find a way of getting protein into five children's bellies. Mm. And eggs are a perfect way of getting that. But at those prices, we just have to find a different way of doing it. As the family's second week on the island nears its end, there's only one household having eggs for breakfast. So, where's Daddy's bacon? It's oh, gone. Uh, it's gone. Completely gone. Do you know what I'm having? Flatbreads with butter. Mom, oh, there's no flatbreads either. There's no flatbreads. Do you know what I'm having? Cheese. Butter. <laughs> Not everything's going Kate and Arwell's way either. One of their chickens has developed a life-threatening infection in its foot. It's not good news, really. And the best thing for a chicken is to, uh, to end her days, unfortunately. Uh, it's for their own happiness, really. I'd rather she go out a happy chicken rather than live the rest of her days out of miseries. But uh, on the flip side, uh, it's nearly Sunday, so I think someone might have a nice roast dinner on Sunday. So I'm going to go finish her off peacefully and as quickly as I and cleanly as I can. Arwell grew up on a farm in West Wales, so is familiar with the most humane way to dispatch the chicken. But uh, no, you can see there what the problem is. Oh, no, no, too down, too down. Too out. Never a pleasant task, and I'm I'm quite happy that that went very well first time. The chicken will be hung overnight, before being gutted and plucked, ready for the table tomorrow. And with a sea much calmer, the chance to go fishing is once again on the cards. And then pull, pull that out of there, just to clean it up a bit. But does the rest of the community prepare for the next trip? I'm flying a flag oh. of any nation. A large sailing boat spotted heading their way. A tree to know where she's come from. In the 1900s, thousands of boats transported goods around our coast and across the world. By 1905, Wales was exporting 45 million tonnes of coal a year.
It wasn't uncommon for cargo boats to sail into small fishing harbours at high tide and beach themselves as the tide went out so that local men could be paid to unload them. I've had a word with the skipper and he's looking for some, uh, some boys to, to unload the cargo. Are you interested in some labour? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? yeah. OK. Paid labour? No, if it's paid labour, count me in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Well? In. It's coal and flour. It's the perfect opportunity for both men and women to earn some extra income. Okay, lower weight. And unlike fishing, it's guaranteed. The men are unloading the boat, while the women are scrubbing the boat's hull. Okay. Okay, lower weight. The sand's my biggest worry. Well, it's not a worry, it's just a bit of a pain. It just slows you down that much more. And moving your own weight through the sand is hard enough, let alone carrying two big sacks of coal. So I think I've probably got about 60 pounds on my shoulder. It's quite physical. I'm not quite sure I'm uh, built for such laborious tasks. For fishermen and women in the 1900s, Hard physical graft was all in a day's work. But for our modern day families, it's proving a shock. He's got his angry face on, and I don't know why. I don't know whether it's because it's just so heavy. He just looks, he looks really cross. When I don't get a smile, I know he's really cross. Of all the men in the village, with a household of seven, Gavin's calorie intake has taken the biggest hit. He died. How many of these are there? Oh, a couple of hundred. Now we're... Half a cheese sandwich in 24 hours. And, and two forks full of uh, corned beef. Giving everything to the kids because the bloody eggs are too expensive. But surviving on so little food, absolutely killing me. Just, I just can't feed ourselves. Simple as that. Just have enough. Get past this. Be fine. Just sometimes in this environment, it's, it's harder than it looks to live in. Just the basic necessity of food alone. Not having that. And feeding your kids first leaves you with very little to operate on. But if you've got a load of eggs, you're fine. I mean, having the chickens has been a bit of a blessing in disguise, really. And some, some of the, we've heard the odd whisper, like, oh, but it's just pure profit. <laughs> yeah, you know, all you're doing is collecting the eggs and selling them. But no, I mean, I'm cleaning the chickens out, I'm checking their health. They do take work in themselves. I'm not just waiting there for the morning, like, go on, where's the egg? Both, there's another, there's another penny, lovely. But Arwell's eggs aren't the only bone of contention. The chickens are... I know it's been killed, oh, right. but we don't know where it is now. Well, I asked Arwell what he was going to do with it. I asked him if he was going to eat it. And he said, no, it's worth too much money to eat. So I said, I don't think there's enough money in the village to buy it. So he said he'd probably eat it. Right, is he sharing? No. That's a question for him. No. That's a question for him. Well, OK, <laughs> hope it chokes him. <laughs> <laughs> but all of the families have their own income as not just the fish. I mean, uh, yes. the Davises, they bake. You have the shop with the powers. That's an income for them and the Barkers, they've got the tavern. That's an income for them. So, I mean, we all have our own little ways of bringing in the sideline. I think I've just got to put a lid on it. I think everything's just magnified in this environment. Yeah. You know, 
you're tired, hungry. Sometimes you are running on empty, and it's very hard. It must have been tough on them. The reality is nothing here comes easy. No. There's effort, be it financial outlay or time. Nothing here is easy. I think for most of the families on, on the island, the honeymoon has now finished. Thanks for your help. Got some money here for you. First of all, ladies. Despite their differences, for everyone, it's payday. Thank you. But in 1900, women were nearly always paid less than men. So the men are getting two shillings sixpence each, and the women are only receiving one shilling. At the start of the 20th century, for the working classes, Saturday night was bath night. I'm not sure I'm just making it dirtier. You are. Yeah. Most families could only afford to wash once a week, sharing the same water. Just pour it all over. Not fast, just bit by bit. Oh my goodness, look at the dirt. Is that off my hands or your face? My face. <laughs> It was customary for the man of the house to go first. And the youngest child last. Let's get you into your bed. With cash in their pockets, the families and the crew of the cargo boat celebrate a hard day's work. The tavern, which historically would have been men only, has relaxed its rules, and tonight, everyone's welcome. Hello, guys. Um, hey, hi. Hiya. Hi, uh, my name is Yannick. What's your name? Uh, Gareth. Gareth, yeah. nice to meet you. You haven't prop said hello properly yet. Gareth. We haven't, yeah. You're all right, mate. Nice yeah, to okay. meet you. Good to see you again. I will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually, um, I'm, I've got no place to stay tonight. Does anyone have any, like, uh, spare bed or something? I'm willing to pay, by the way, so... Well, actually, I think we could accommodate there. We had a spare room. Oh, okay. One of the cargo boat crew, 21-year-old Yannick Martinez, has decided to jump ship, a relatively common occurrence. You got a bed? We have a bed. In the 1900s, over 28% of merchant seamen were foreign-born. She's an excellent cook as well. Oh, well, that, that adds to it. <laughs> Good porridge in the morning. Yeah? Lunch? <laughs> what, yeah. what sort of money were you thinking of? Two shillings and sixpence a week. I think I can do that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Then we have a deal. We have a deal. And if you're eating too much, it'll have to go up. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the village, Yannick. Okay, thank you. Welcome to the village. Hey. Thank you, thank Welcome, you. Welcome, Yannick. Cargo boat's been a great boost to the community. It's brought in cash and a lodger for the barkers. We are a bit short of cash, so yes, it'll be a big help. Hopefully, oh. it will improve our finances. I'm not sure how we'll cope with the intrusion on the privacy. I won't be able to walk around naked to use the chamber pot in the middle of the night, will I? Or nor will you. <laughs> <laughs> It's Sunday, the Sabbath, and in 1900, it's a day of worship and rest. Our house guest, Yannick, is a very nice young man. He's a little bit off the wall and he reminds us a little bit of our son. Yannick's modern life as a computer science student at Bangor University is about as far removed from 1900 life as you can get. Yesterday I went to sleep and I was pretty excited about waking up as well. 
because I, I, I didn't know what to expect this day and I still don't know. Yannick was born in Spain and has lived in several different countries, but is currently settled in the UK. I'm at a stage in my life where I'm sort of trying to figure out, OK, what do I want to do? And I realise I want to do pretty much everything, really. I want to go to the edge of the world, as far as I can go. As a hub of global sea travel, by the start of the 20th century, the UK was seeing a steady influx of overseas sailors. There is a knife, OK. Thank you. Ah. The 1905 oh, Aliens well. Act introduced new controls. For the first time, immigrants had to register on arrival at British shores. Like oh, potato. And beef and onion. And potato. Potato. Yeah. potato. Mm. Yannick will need to find a job if he wants to stay. Mm. Right, yeah. That's really good, yeah. Yep. <laughs> They're all pretty welcoming so far. Mm. I wonder mm. who this is. My man. What are you looking for? <laughs> something to eat. I want something to eat, oh, darling. In 1900, working-class children often begged for food. And within less than two weeks, the Davis's youngest child has picked up the habit. Are you still hungry, Arlo? Your belly. Your belly's mm. hungry, is it? <laughs> when I came in yesterday, uh, I heard some stories. I heard someone say that they had to go without eating just so that they could feed the little ones. And there's lack of food and things for the kids. Everyone becomes grumpy and they're hungry. My fear would be that people turn on each other. If we all sort of work as a team and understand this, then it, will, it should, be, should be OK. With a community spirit still fragile, Lydia's trying to bring everyone back together. Okay. Hello, I did. Just to let you know, we're going to hold a service in our house. OK, no problem. So would you like to come along? It's going to be a little, just a little thing yeah. in our house. No yeah? problem. OK. Fab, we're aiming for about half past ten. Grand. All right. See okay. Ta-da, ta -da, ta -da. Fishing communities were often deeply religious, and it provided much-needed spiritual support. With only a ruined chapel on the island, the families are coming together in the power's front room. We all scrub up pretty well. Good looking audience. I'm going to read a little passage now from, from the Bible. It contains fish and fishing, so I thought we'd probably relate to this in a different way. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. We're all trying to um, survive the challenge and overcome it. Children and I think this is where we've all got to pull together. They answered him, no. And he said unto Support them, one another. On be generous with one another. Be there for one another. They cast therefore. And if we can make our priority being united and helping meet the needs of those around us, then I think everyone's a winner in those situations. All right, come on then. It was a lovely service. Gareth was just fabulous, he really was. Um, he did, he did, a, he did a really good job. Arwell's chicken is gutted and ready for roasting. But instead of taking it home for himself... Can I have a quick word with my mum or dad outside? Yeah, yeah, come in. Oh, hello. <laughs> As you do. Hold on, Evan. Oh. It's all right. I've got this, I wondered. If you were still interested, not a lot of meat on her. Why is it Sunday? That's really, really generous of you. No problem. Seems we've just had a load of bacon. With cash in their pockets from yesterday's work, the Davis family have eaten well today, and Gavin's decided not to accept the chicken. All right, thanks. Very kind of you to think of us. 
And Arwell's offer seems to have made all the difference. How bad do I feel? He's just offered me the chicken. No, I said it's very, very kind. But you have the chicken. <laughs> he has restored my faith in humanity. Next time. Truth is, you're not eating enough. I am. Fine. You're not. I know you're not. The powers come up with a plan to help the Davises. We were thinking of putting together a food hamper. But not everyone's on side. I don't. I don't give charity like that. I don't like that. Personally, I cannot stand back and let friends starve. And the men head out on their toughest fishing trip yet. Lift it! Lift it! Ah. Right. Uh, brush it down, Ed. I know, I know. Really good stuff. Right. Even a light bulb. It's early morning in the villagers' third week on the tidal island of Llanwyn, off the west coast of Anglesey. That's it. We need quite a bit of stones in there, boys. Professional fisherman with over 40 years' experience, Mickey Beachy, is teaching the men a new technique, preparing lobster pots to be set out at sea. I need six good pieces of bait from the shed is in the barrel. It's quite a strong uh, smell going on. It's because we've got rotting fish. The men are using traditional hand-woven lobster pots. A piece of fish bait is fixed inside and the pots placed out at sea. Hopefully the lobsters will smell the bait and climb in through the top, becoming trapped inside. There's no supermarket on the corner. They're selling their produce with the catching. We've had ribs and drabs of fish or whatever. So it's a bit important for them to catch some lobsters so that they can sell it, get a few more, but man, bit more money in their pockets to be able to feed their families. Just like today, lobsters were a highly prized catch at the beginning of the 20th century, proving popular with the upper classes. Oh, that's perfect. Bit of weight in there, isn't it? Yeah. Tell you what, if we make a success of this over the next few days, we're going to go into that last week. We've got a bit of money on our hip. With five young children to feed, out of all the families, the success of the lobster potting is most important for Gavin Davis. Yeah. I want this to be really good, because if we have a good catch, we could eat really, really well. You can get by being hungry, but it'd be nice just to have that big lift in the community and have a successful couple of days. Have a seat, Yanni. Oh, thank you. Student Yannick Martinez has moved in with Clive and Cheryl Barker as a lodger. It's working really well. He's very, very easy company. Very helpful. Does a lot of collecting of the water. Yeah, it's, it's good, all good. And the extra money's really useful. But to cover his costs, Yannick needs to work. Morning. Oh, morning. Morning. Morning, Joe. Thank you. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. He's managed to secure a job as an apprentice with Joe Ormond, the island shipwright. Come on in, Yannick. Thank you. Whereabouts were you born? I was born in Spain. My father's Ugandan. Okay. My mother is Spanish. Most of my life I've been in England, so I'm kind of more used to the people mm. and the way they are. Where would you ultimately settle, do you think? I think anywhere close to the sea would be... Here would be quite really nice. Cool. Yeah, this place is beautiful. So ancient. Mm, it is, yeah. It is. So long as the weather stays warm and I can jump into the <laughs> sea. <laughs> as an apprentice in 1900, Yannick's work and even his personal life would have been strictly controlled by the contract between him and his employer, Joe. The said apprentice will serve his master and obey his lawful commands. <laughs> he will not embezzle or waste the goods of his master, nor frequent taverns oh. or alehouses. Very Can good. we read the terms and conditions one more time? 
Apprenticeships go back to medieval times. By the late 19th century, there were over 340,000 apprentices across Britain. So the cut happens as it, as it comes towards you, not away from you. Yannick will be helping Joe to build a new dinghy for the community. <laughs> make it look real easy. If he can make a good impression. With potentially high earnings at stake, Mickey would rather not rely on a novice when it comes to the difficult job of setting the lobster pots at sea. Clive Barker from Kent used to fish for a living in his early 30s. We're rigging the pots with, obviously, a buoy and a line. They're weighted. They're going to be put over the side of the boat. All you'll see is the buoy floating. And then you just sit them there, baited, waiting for the big beetle to crawl in. Since Clive arrived on the island, he's been unable to sail and earn money because of a bad case of gout. It's been a testing time for him and his wife, Cheryl. Is it you struggling? That's all right, that's okay. But today has seen an improvement in his mobility. He's um, been chomping at the bit, found it very difficult having to stay shorebound while everyone else goes. And that's why he really needs to get out there. Okay, here we go. I was getting a bit disappointed by not being able to get out on the water, but I'm um, going fishing now by the looks of it. Looking forward to it very much. Clive and Mickey are wearing modern life jackets alongside traditional oilskins made from waxed cotton, protecting them from the elements. You don't want to end up on the boulders, do we? No. The baited lobster pots need to be dropped close to the rocks around the island. I'm struggling to get a bring around. A tricky job as the swell's picking up. Okay, you can drop that pot, Clive. He's gone. <sighs> Lovely to be out on the sea. Don't mind the rough water at all. In the boat shed, Joe's got Yannick started on a set of oars for the new boat. Never plane off the edge like that, because that will just split. Oh, so yeah. you've always got to go into it. OK. Yeah? Yeah. Small remote communities like this relied on their own skills to make and repair all their fishing equipment. I'm on this island, constantly thinking about surviving and what I'm going to eat. <laughs> on my next meal, but here when I'm when I'm sort of working on the wood and on the oars, I sort of forget about everything else. It's like a meditation. Yeah, it's like I'm diving into a little world where only I and the oar exist. <laughs> so it's it's nice. Natalie Davis is also adjusting to life on the island. It sounds weird to say it, but it seems enjoyable today. Just sort of outside, it's gorgeous weather. And like, if everybody else is doing theirs, you can chat. Everyone's milling around, it's lovely. Oh, come on, Dad, jump in. You're going to get your feet wet in the sea there. There's a shark! Back it down. There's a shark! Back it down! Back it down! Back it down! Back it down! And I've got to do like this, and you do what I'm doing, and go, oh! I would definitely say we're learning as the weeks go by. Getting to grips with the routine of things. It, it has very quickly become like our normal life. For Lydia Power, life back home in Cardiff seems far away. We've got so much to be grateful for modern day, but if a lady from this era came into the 21st century, I think they'd be completely overwhelmed by the pace, expectations, and modern society. It's hard to beat the simplicity of life that we have here. Yeah. <laughs> 
together. With all the pots set, it's a waiting game to find out if they've caught anything. Until then, they've no choice but to eke out what's left in their store cupboards. Come on, I want to see clear plates. None more so than family of seven, the Davises. Have they got anything for after, Mum? Uh, apple. Whoa! <laughs> Give my apple to these. Yeah, it, that was excluding me and you. <laughs> The truth is, you're not eating enough. I am. Fine. You're not. No, I know you're not. not. You've had breakfast today, and that's it. How is that enough? You know, they're not complaining. They're just like, we'll have another bowl of porridge. You can't have porridge three times a day. There's just that nothing worse than that feeling of not being able to feed your kids. Two doors down, Lydia and her husband, Gareth, run the village shop from their front room. 12, 3, 6, 18. I'm in a position, I suppose, with a shop where I can see what people are buying and how well people are eating. Mm. Um, Cheryl and Clive are fine, Kate and Adwell are fine, um, but I am a bit concerned about the Davises. Yeah, yeah. The, their greatest need right now is, is food. School, OK. Uh-uh. Right, well, do you have to avoid me? Then the theory is now in the end. Amen. Amen. As devout Christians, the powers are a charity minded family. When you think of, well, the Bible said they shared everything in common, yeah. especially mm. in small communities like this on the island. Yeah. And at the moment, I just feel there's need in our community. Yeah, and I think this is where, as a community, we need to pull together. With no social security safety net, it was down to local charities, institutions, and individuals to help those in need. We're thinking, you know, the Davises are struggling a bit financially yeah. um, and struggling to put food quite literally on yeah, the table. Be fair, we were thinking of putting together um, like a food hamper, essentially, yeah. Yeah. and that we can just present to them. Just if you give us some idea of what you'd mm. like us to. Yeah. Contribute, we are more than happy. Tri Thinking with Cheryl's home cooking, it'd be mm. lovely for you to cook. Yeah, and oh, so fine. if you do a yeah. meal yeah. and a pudding, yeah, I think that'd be amazing. Yeah. I've really, we've both really felt for yeah. them. I can't imagine the feeling looking in the pot and there's nothing there. Yeah, I know. So that's fine, I consider it done. Hello, hello, next stop. Kate Evans and her partner Arwell John from Swansea. I was going to ask, could we put some eggs in the hamper? Well, I'd be happy to donate four eggs. I'm just thinking, as a family of seven, mm -hmm. um, could I push you to seven eggs? They are one seven each, eggs. Uh... One each. Too much for you guys. Yeah, quite yeah. okay. okay. a few eggs. Tomorrow eggs. We should have it. Thank you. Thank you so much. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next day, and Gavin's off with Mickey to check on the lobster pots, the potential gold at the bottom of the sea. I'm going for the off-white neutral look. Not getting out onto the water is proving a challenge for experienced rower Kate. In the 1900s, there are very few examples of women becoming part of a sailboat's crew. I would love to get out in the fishing boats and have a go. I started rowing when I was about 14 in the Bristol Channel. I'm then, when I was in my 20s, started rowing for Wales. 
But what I've found in the last three weeks is that women were tied to the home and, you know, cut off from the workplace. Yeah, I was finding it a bit drudgery, really. The fight for women's suffrage was becoming increasingly intense at the beginning of the 20th century, with meetings and marches in many towns and cities. But it wasn't until 1918 that women finally got the vote. I don't think there's any limitations to abilities according to your sex. Because really, if you're capable of doing the work, just do the work. As a man in the 1900 community, for Arwell, island living has proved more satisfying. She has been really missing going out in the boats. Well, she's a little bit jealous, to be honest with you. I'm going for muscling this instead. Disappointing me. That's very disappointing. I'm not. I'm not giving up for a second. Not a chance. Adwell and I were up, both of us independently, all last night. Overnight, Kate's been having second thoughts about Lydia's charity hamper. Neither of us felt particularly easy afterwards with the idea of giving just such a demonstrative, obvious thing. Um, and in our heads, Gavin would be pretty crestfallen that he'd not been able to provide. And I know it's meant well, but I just, I just think we can do things on the quiet that aren't going to make them feel such a needy case. I think is a bit of a slap in the face, personally. If that's how you both feel, mm. then, you, you know, you're at liberty to do whatever makes you feel comfortable. Mm. If you'd rather but... give something small, and if you'd rather do it yourself, yeah. go ahead. I've done the meals. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's it, really. I can't yeah. do a lot. I mean, you didn't ask me to do any more, no, did you? No, but because I think this is using your gifts. That's right. I was also a little bit bristled by being slightly, or the feeling that we were slightly strong-armed into, oh, can't you give this much, can't you give this much? I don't like that. I don't, I don't give charity like that. Um, I, yeah, let so... me start then by just saying I'm really sorry that you felt um, pushed to give. No, it wasn't that we wasn't pushed to give, it was let just me, sort of the amount it, but yeah. No, I'm sorry you felt that way. I, like I say, if you don't want to be a part of it, mm. you really don't. And personally, I cannot stand back and let friends starve. Give me a show, please, OK, Cher? OK, do you don't want a cup of tea? Sure. I have the kettle on. No, I'm fine, thanks. OK. I hope I didn't upset her. Sorry? I hope I didn't upset her, but I think I may have done. Kate can be a bit... Confrontational. I'm sure she doesn't mean to be, but come across as a little bit confrontational. We'd gone to bed so chuffed a bit that we were all coming together to meet this need to do something. Beacon. Whilst the hampers a lovely idea, you're giving people a care package that'll last a day. It's not about giving people handouts, it's about giving them the means to maintain self-respect and dignity and work their own way out of those problems. There's two, there's two sources of meat there, of protein there, with the corned beef and the bacon. We tried to do something that would gather the community. So, yeah, I was really disappointed. The way we try and do that is by giving our time, 
giving what we can uh, with our skills, teaching. I spent yesterday teaching the kids to sew. So, yeah, it's just a different way of doing it. So I'm going to get this. Just let it come on this. Stay where you are. Perfect. Bloody perfect. Good boy. Spot on, mate. Here we go. Right. Right, pull it in. Let's have a look, see what we've got. Yeah, right. I grab hold of that. Keep it, keep it coming across the back of the boat. What? Uh, right. And there's nothing in it. It's another disappointment for the families. As of about an hour ago, we ran out of money. It's all been spent. Ah. Careful, Gibbs. little gifts and we just wanted to extend our love to you and make sure that you and all the kids have got no food in the house. Oh my goodness, Lydia. Yeah. You are just, oh my goodness. You're so caring. Oh. You're, you're the loveliest family. You're easy to love. You're easy to love. Oh my God, it's really overwhelming. Thank you so much. So share us all the cooking. <laughs> Oh my goodness, it's really overwhelming, it really is, but it's just so, so thoughtful. I feel so loved. They're just the best people. I don't think I've ever been more excited to see a leak. You know, it, oh, oh my goodness. Thank you. So, so much. No, you're welcome. It's so, so thoughtful. Oh, well, it was Lydia's idea, we all went along. Thank you so You're much. You're welcome. It's so, so special. It's quite nice, actually, because we're eating it. <laughs> Should we go and have it. some dinner? Yeah. yeah. Come on, yeah. yeah. Look at that! <laughs> look what they've got! I'm a little bit speechless here. Do you know what? Isn't that so, so kind? <laughs> it's a big step for Gavin. <laughs> He's turned down previous attempts at charity within the community. Look at this. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> We will eat tonight. Including mummy. Um. Hello. Hello, hello. I'm not very good at this, I'm just going to give you a hug and a kiss. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Carl. And you? Is that all right? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm holding it together, so I'm just going to do this. Oh. I'll even give you a kiss as well, mate. Oh, mate. There's really no, oh. there really was no need. <laughs> Oh, You've got God. very generous parents. You. You're very lucky. Yeah. Love you. Love you too. Love you too. Oh, tell you what, I'm going to enjoy this. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, you have a certain amount of pride as a so-called head of the house and you want to provide for your kids and you don't want people to think that you're struggling. But it, I've, I've not, my pride hasn't taken a knock with this because I think it's come from such genuine, loving people. It, it's not felt like charity. It's just nice to be part of a community, isn't it? Yeah. Lots of fish. Some fish would be good this time. With the lobster pots unproductive so far, and food supplies and savings running low, Mickey's got a new plan. We've got a golden opportunity to go on a bigger boat. We're going to try betting. We're doing long lining, and we're doing hand lining. That's the good part of it. The bad part of it is maybe a couple of nights overnight on the boat. 
He's arranged for them to go fishing for further and longer than ever before. It's a big challenge for the novice fishermen, and also a greater risk as they head into unknown waters using yet more new equipment. It's probably one of the most dangerous occupations you could have. Doesn't matter what era you're in. In the 1900s, around one in 10 apprentice fishermen were lost at sea. 10% doesn't sound an awful lot, but if that 10% is your flesh and blood and your child, your brother, your son, you know, it's a, it's, it doesn't matter, does it, the percentages? It's your own flesh and blood that's gone. How are you doing? Hello. Are you OK? Yeah. Why have you got that face on? You're going away. Going away. Don't worry, we'll be fine. I've never really left my family for more than a few nights at a time, and even then it's very, very rare. So being away for two or three nights is a massive deal. I think because we've got five kids and we've got a busy life, that Natalie and I hugely rely on each other. So not being around means that everything's gonna fall on Natalie. You all right? Yeah. You want a hug? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I can see. <laughs> I'll see. You're fine. It's going to be amazing. OK? Yeah. I promise you, it'll be brilliant. As Gavin's eldest son, it's falling on nine-year-old Jew to step up as the man of the house. You all right me going away for a couple of days? Doesn't worry you or anything. Just make sure you're a good boy for your mum, OK? Just make sure you help out as much as you can. I'll show you away. I'm going to try and earn some money as well. OK. Come here, then give us a hug. Be fine, all right? Mm-hmm. The fishing trip has implications for Kate, too. While the men are away, the lobster pots will still need checking. I've got uh, a proposition for you. How do you fancy a little bit of rowing? Yeah! Yeah. Good. <laughs> Lovely. Good. OK, there. Be my day. OK, well done. Well done, well Although women very rarely went far out to sea, they were often to be found fishing inshore from rowing boats. Yay! Get out of water. Been killing me just looking at it. In all honesty, it's a bit of a game changer for me actually, because to have something that takes me from this strip of houses would actually be pretty special for me personally. It's the next morning, and the men are heading down to board their new vessel. At 65 foot, she's a bigger boat than they're used to, allowing them to go out further and for longer, hopefully catching more fish. Of course I'm worried about him. He's quite old now to be going fishing, no communication. Won't know how they're doing, won't know anything. So, yes, yeah, yes, it is a big worry, big worry. Come on, he's back with you now. He'll be that busy. Dad, how far are you going? Don't know. But I'm coming back. How many fish are you going to get? How many fish do you want me to get? Lots. Nine. Nine. Okay, Daddy, we're going to 
Okay, okay. love you lots. Okay, love you lots. Miss you. Hi, Chibach. Yeah, Chibach. Good job, Dad. Look after each other. Yeah. Hi. Don't fall over, bud, eh? It's going to miss him. It's going to miss him a lot. Have your daddy, Griff. It will be the longest the men and women have been apart since they arrived on the island, and the stakes are high. We just need some bloody fish. You know, it's, I think it's got to the point now where I'm not too concerned what kind of fish we catch. Let's just catch loads of them. The men will be using every technique they've learned so far. But crucially, Mickey is also going to teach them to use a net, their best chance of getting a big catch. Come on, boys, let's get the fish in. While the men are away, Kate and Cheryl are checking the lobster pots. It feels nice doing what I know I can do, but I haven't been able to thus far. And the truth is, villages like this lost a lot of guys. Someone has to keep bringing stuff in. Many women in these coastal communities were often as skilled at inshore fishing as the men. Nearly there, nearly there. Got her. Got her. Got her. Yeah. Here we come. Here she comes. 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 Oh. oh, hello. That was a resounding plop. Oh. Got it. Not yet. One, two, three. In. Come on, you bugger. Nothing in the first one. Disappointing. Push fingers. Right. That one next. We're getting out of the way up there. Mickey wants the men to cast a net for the first time. We'll just rotate it a bit, yeah. Roll it round a bit, get that knot out of the way. Right, hold on then, hold it there, and hold, hold it, it yeah. hold it, hold it. Ideally, if I was going to shoot the net, it would be right by those rocks in that channel there. The gill net works by snagging fish as they swim into it. It's anchored with a chain at both ends, and buoys are used to keep it upright in the water. It's key not to tangle it. Leave, check your boy out, Gav. Come on in. Ready to go? Yeah. Should you drive, got it over the side? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Good boys. But at 300 yards long, it's unwieldy and could easily pull an unsuspecting man overboard. Slowly, slowly, slowly. It's a bit of a mission, actually because we're competing against the wind and the size of the boat. There's more dangers involved. If anybody's feet are in the way, there's only one way to go, and that's over the side. That's it, that's it, good boys. Easy, easy, easy. Feet, feet, feet and hands and buttons. What, yeah. do, what do we do it? Turn around a feet, bit. Feet, Gareth, feet, Gareth. It's getting heavy now, boys, so keep it away from your body. The net's now anchored to the seabed, and as the 80-ton boat drifts away from it, the men are struggling as the net pulls against them. Whoop. You right, Gav? Oh, I've got to go. I've got to go. I'll take the tension in. Take the tension in. The wind doesn't like a sail, though. It's just not right. That's the worst ever I've shot a net. With the net at full stretch, finally the second anchor is dropped to the seabed. Okay, chain in. Chain in. Right, you go on, man. Easy. 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 Net in. 
Nice one, Mickey. Hold on, boys. That was all rough, though, was it, too? Yeah, it was quite intense. It catches the water, catches the wind, and it's pulling. And pulling all five of us uh, at the same time. It was dangerous. I was by, so telling you no. They won't know if they've caught anything until tomorrow. Upsy daisy. Just le lean on to me. I'm, yeah. I'm braced here. You're okay. These clothes are so cumbersome. They're pain in the arse, aren't they? Kate and yeah. Cheryl are hauling in the last of the lobster pots. Oh, there's a lobster! Oh my God! We got one! Oh! Oh, we've got big daddy. That's a big bugger! Oh my oh. God! Whew. Look at that! We've got two! Wow. <laughs> That's it! Yee. Oh, I'm nice. a little nervous of picking it up, but I have got yeah. gloves. Wow. Oh my God! Look at the size of that! He's feisty. Look at him going for it. Two lobsters are worth a full day's pay. Oh. oh, hang on. No, I can see eggs. She's a lady. She's a girl. Oh, she is a lady. Yeah, yeah definitely. Okay. Both <laughs> ladies. Are they? Oh, no. no! In order to protect lobster numbers, egg laden females are generally no longer taken in UK waters. Look at how. Beautiful oh, she is. She is lovely. She would have eaten beautifully. Yeah. Sorry, lovely. So, both lobsters are returned. Back you go. But they're still a positive. <laughs> we beat the boys. That's why it's <laughs> in my head just now. <laughs> Not that we're competitive or anything. Tomorrow's another day, boys. Yeah. Bed early tonight now, and we'll see what tomorrow brings. What can you see, Evan? I'm trying to see for that boat. Oh, I wonder how they're getting on. I hope, for their sake, they'll get fish. It'll feel good coming back, being able to tell the wives and the kids, look what we've got. It'll be nice for them. It'll be nice for us too, mind. <laughs> After 24 hours at sea, the men are about to find out if their hard work has paid off. First, they're preparing to bring in a long line that they set yesterday. Have you still got him, Gav? Yeah, still Good. got him. Go on both right. side. Gavin is spotting for the small boys that mark its position. Just to the port side. So I've lost them behind the sail now. Oh, I've got it. 80 yards. Yeah. Yep, got him. Straight ahead. Dead ahead, 100 yards. I got him, I got him. You got him, yeah? Yeah. Mickey's pulling up the boy that marks one end of the 200 yard long line with 100 hooks along its length. Boy in. It's been suspended just above the seabed overnight. Okay, this is the one, boys. Two fish and every hook. Easy. Okay, here it comes in, boys. Whoops, coming up. Whoops, coming up. Hey, hey, hey. We've got a skate, boys. Hey, two skates. Hey, hey, two good. skates. Two skates. Oh, one for us. One for us. Oh, well done, guys. Three new fish we never caught them before. 
Gareth's using a single blow between the eyes. That's it, good boy. To quickly and humanely kill the fish. Right, feel those, right? That's These the are thornback side. ray, commonly known That's by fishermen side. as skate. Beautiful, aren't they, really? They are amazing. Beautiful, Beautiful fish. Despite their excitement at catching a new species, the 100 hook longline has only delivered three fish. Let's call it half time. Half time in the cup final. It's not over yet. We'll take both if something happens. On the island, the women have decided to supplement their dwindling supplies with what they can forage from the land. Go there, ladies, let's go. They're heading for the mainland, across the tidal causeway. We don't have skirts to get wet. Which way, Auntie Cher? Down here. As an experienced forager, Cheryl's leading the women and will help identify what's safe to eat, if they can find anything. Oh, go Cheryl! Hang on, don't eat in my knickers. I don't mind it on my skirt, but not in my knickers. <laughs> it's in my knickers. <laughs> not the best way to get down the sand dune, was it? But quite fun. <laughs> It is lovely to be out of the house, away from the stove. Sounds awful, but away from the kids as well. Just to have that little bit of freedom, to be able to have a laugh with the girls, it's lovely. Yannick's been left in the village, making sure the stoves don't go out, while 12-year-old Lily is looking after the younger children. In 1900, older children were often called upon to care for their younger siblings. I'm just going to do the washing, so then when my mum comes back from a hard day of work, she won't need to clean the dishes. Out at sea, the men are getting ready to pull in the net. Good stay, Expectations stay, stay. are high. I don't think we're going to have enough time to Lay it out. get all the fish out. Yeah. So it's going to be a bloody good massive haul, pulling it in as fast as we can. What we're trying to do is not snag under the boat. We don't want the boat to drift over the net. That's the, that's no. the idea. Good shot. OK, I've got the... We'll pull it in this way now. OK, boys. On to the deck now then. We go wind against us again. Right, Arwell? Yeah. Pull that line. What I've got? Yeah. They've got to move fast. The boat's drifting, the wind's blowing, and the net's dragging through the water. But hopefully, it's full of fish. You can get that fish out, we've got time. Quickly feed it through, feed it through. At the start of the 20th century, fishermen all along the Welsh coast regularly pulled in hundreds of fish in a single catch. OK, leave it in, keep pulling, keep yeah. pulling, keep pulling. Quicker, quicker. Watch your feet, lads. A lot of net down here. Oh, well, you're in it. Come on. Nice and steady. Nice and steady. Get it close now. But as they pull the net in, it's not looking good. Keep coming. Keep coming. It's caught. Feed round to me. It's caught. Feed round to me. Gav, Gav, this was snagged under it. Ah, it's one big bloody mess. To make matters worse, the net's now tangled around the bow. It's hooked down here, see? If they don't release it quickly and the net tangles in the rudder, then the out-of-control boat could smash onto the nearby rocks. Boat hook, boat hook. Is it going? No. A 
member of the boat crew clambers overboard to try and free the net. No, quick! I've got you. Don't worry about it, Bennett. Just get it off there. Mickey has no choice but to call it. Lift it! Lift it! They have cut the net to free it. The men haul in both halves of the damaged net. Bring that side in. Bring the side in. That's it. It's all in. It's a disaster. Oh, hell. One bloody fish. Is that it? Yeah, that's what you call an anticlimax. We put out a 300 yard net and had one fish in it. That feels like a right kick in the teeth. After two days at sea, the men have only caught a handful of fish. Up best, please. Not enough for four hungry families. Don't worry, we all understand your frustration. Really not happy at the moment. I'm disappointed for myself. And I'm more disappointment for the boys because they, they were really wanted that to work and I wanted it to work for them. But... So what are we looking for, Cher? You might find puff balls, or you might find shaggy ink caps. <laughs> <laughs> looking for shaggy ink caps, apparently. Oh, oh look! One mouthful, that'll feed an army. Picking and eating wild mushrooms is potentially very dangerous, but Cheryl knows what she's looking for. Cheryl? Yeah? So have a look at this one. Oh, my goodness. That smells mushroomy. And I'm sure it's edible. Foraging for mushrooms and other wild food has been practised for millennia and would have been a key part of the diet in 1900. Oh, what's this? <laughs> Shaggy ink cap. Is oh, it? Fab. That's an ink cap. Absolutely. Well done. Pop it in. Good job. Let's go to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> On the way back, the women stop off at the causeway to pick seaweed. This is lava seaweed. Traditionally in Wales, this is the seaweed that we eat. So in Welsh, we call it baralau. I've never found it wild before myself. And there's plenty here, and it's free. Girls, I think the tide's coming in. Yeah. It's turned. It Back at home, Lydia's busy making a traditional Welsh recipe of lava bread. The seaweed's been boiled for hours, and now she's frying it in bacon fat with a sprinkling of oats. But it's not to everyone's taste. I've added just a little bit of porridge oats. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lydia. I'm really sorry. <laughs> It's seaweed, Arlo. <laughs> it's tasty. It's on your cheek. It's on your cheek there. You want to try that? It's called lava bread. Come on. Go on, tell me back. Tell me back. I like that. Good. I can put it on a piece of plate. I didn't think it was when I was. I would when I was picking slime off a rock. But <laughs> I do really like it. Lily, do you want to try?
As the light starts to fade, the men have one last chance to put out a long line on their remaining net. Okay, let's go then. Out she goes, nice and easy. Right. Nice and steady. Is it going out the right? Yeah. Grab it. Punching up there in a minute. Yeah. I'm on it. You got it? Yeah, I'm alright. Is there, feed it out. Go on, go on, go on. Right. Keep the tension on the boy. Keep the tension on the boy. That's it. That's better, boys. That's it. Get okay. Yeah. That's brilliant. Anchor down. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. And boy away. That looks a bit better, doesn't it? There you go. Look at that. Magic. Well, Jesus, I want to thank you. At the end of the day, the weather turned and the conditions changed in our favour. And I ask now in the name of Jesus that when we wake, there'll be fish on those lines, there'll be fish in those nets, and we'll be able to go home with fish and a good report for our families in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen, Amen. Sada. As dawn breaks, there's a flurry of activity on board. Right, Gareth, go, Gareth. go with the... Clive, go that way. In as quick as you can. Right. It comes line. Who's coming to you? Yeah. First, the men are bringing in the long line. Right down the deck, right down the deck. Empty hook. Mind your fingers. Mind your fingers. Bullhus. Wow. Wow. Yeah, nice yeah. fish. A member of the dogfish family. Look at all the fish. With one swift, humane blow, the bull hus is dead. Right, line in. But one fish isn't going to feed the families for long. All the men's hopes are now resting on the net. That's it. Good boy, Gareth. Good boy, Gareth. Herring. Herring. In it comes, in it comes, quickly. We've got a neck full of herring, boys. In it comes. Oh, that's there, we like yeah, there we go. There we go. Good to see. Good, good. That's good. all we like to see. Brilliant, boys. Well done. Oh. Yes. That, boys? That's what that's we're all talking, like to see, boys. This, this is what I call sweet relief. It just proves if you put the effort in, you keep persisting, no matter your ability, sheer determination will win out in the end. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. <laughs> Absolutely ecstatic. Well done. Putting steam on the table, as they say. But we can live without a bit of the pressure of catching out. Finally, success. 81, 82, 83. It's a new record. 84. 85. 85. That'll feed us for the week. Good effort, boys. Perfect. Well done. Perfect At the very last minute, the men have pulled it off. They've caught 85 herring, three mackerel, three thornback rays, and one bullhus. They can return home with their heads held high. Get home, give him a hug. <laughs> Get him away! Get him away! Daddy! 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 <laughs> Excited much? <laughs> Daddy! Daddy! 
Evan! I can see you! Hey! Hey, buddy! Hey, buddy! That's the kind of welcome you want. After three days and two nights at sea. Hello. It's a hero's welcome. Okay. I can't tell you how glad I am to have my feet on ground that's not moving. I've missed you so much. Daddy! All right. So glad to see you. Nice to be back. How many fish did you get? Oh, I pulled out the bag at last minute. That was a chance to Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's only a little bit, it's only a little bit. Where are you? Yeah. Did you get right. first? Ah. <laughs> it went very well. Did you, were you pleased to be out there? Yeah. I bet you were. <laughs> Tell me what you wanted to do, you've been out in that boat. Yeah, it was lovely. <clears throat> Show us some money then, boys. <laughs> so, yeah. there's 80, 85, 85 herring mackerel in there and pulled out the sea at, what was it? Six o'clock this morning. Six o'clock this half morning. Six, yeah. So what's that? That's a thorn ray. Thorn. Thorn back ray. Do you want to touch? <laughs> I think we've come a really, really long way. Just, yeah. Starting to feel like a fisherman of sorts now. Wow. Isn't that beautiful? We'll have a good last week. It'll be good. Well, we'll be smashing. <laughs> good effort. Well done. Hey. Give yourselves a clap. Next time, the modern industrial age beckons, threatening their traditional livelihoods. There's no way you can keep with that. Can't stop progress, can you? The community are forced to adapt to stay afloat. Gav. Yes, Squire. Look at the size of my muscle. I'm not sure how much of a good idea this is. <laughs> can't get out. But it all proves too much for one family. This is our end now, isn't it? This is actually our end. Same way? Yeah, that way. Might need a bit of water on here, really. A bit of spit? Yeah, a bit of spit. I'm glad he, I'm glad he was here this man. Go ahead. <laughs> he wants a good soak in this stone. The four families who are living on the tidal island of Sandwin, off the coast of Anglesey, have settled into life of a traditional 1900 fishing community. Clive, who was a professional fisherman over 40 years ago, is working with fishwives Lydia and Natalie. I'm going to have to have a go. Preparing the skate the men caught at the end of last week. Through the bone, so you just cut that bone. Right. A bit of bone. Lift the wings, a bit spiky, but you have to be careful to get hold of it. And then just run that right along there. Like just that. like that. Wow. You've got a wing there. Okay. Just dip there. Okay. okay. Take as much meat off as you can, and then down close in there with the knife. Like that. Once the three skate and the 89 other fish are ready for sale, the families are hoping for their best earnings yet from the fishmonger. We've got one last pot to pick up yet. Out at sea, professional fisherman Mickey, who's worked the Welsh coast since he was eight, and Arwell are checking on the lobster pots. They're both keen to add to the recent big catch. This is going to be a bit dodgy, this is out. This is a bit close to the rock. Keep going as you are. Le left hand down. Left hand down. Right hand down. Oh, that's it. That's it. Right. right hand down, sharpish. So it's a good boy, good boy. Yeah. There's nothing there. With the pots empty, they try handlining, one of the oldest and simplest fishing techniques that uses a reel of hooks to catch the fish. clear in. Down in the boat shed, under the guidance of shipwright Joe, apprentice Yannick is putting the finishing touches to the community's new dinghy. 
They'll use it to fish in the shallows around the island. Okay, so what we're going to do... So we keep, we'll keep the stitch all on the top surface here. Mm -hmm. Up and down. So you go down once. Mm -hmm. Yannick joined the community two weeks ago when he jumped ship from a cargo boat, replicating many other mariners who settled in the UK during the first decade of the 20th century. They want to look the same. I know. <laughs> That's what I mean. But it's good that they don't look the same. You know why? Why? They have some character. Yeah. Handmade. Handmade special oars. Yep. By Yannick the Apprentice. Yes, master. <laughs> it's a master. That sounds good. I like. I like master Yannick. Yeah. That's my first oar, pretty much complete. But yeah, I'm really, I'm really pleased with with how they look and the work I've put into it and seeing the final result. And yeah, tomorrow we will try them out, and hopefully they don't snap. Mickey and Arwell are having some success handlining. Oh, fish on. Oh, dude, three of it. Boy. Every extra fish is more food and money for the community. Another three mackerel there now. So I've got four today. Just four more than the pro. Not that I'm saying much. Well, I've been doing most of the rowing. <laughs> Ah, well, to be fair to him, was quite good. He was good, but um, he is a quite competitive chap. And, and I, what I, you know, when you're the two of you in the boat, there's no competition. You, you need to work as a team, really. Albeit he listened to what I was saying, I felt that he, it was on the tip of his tongue that he wanted to do it some other way, you know, his way. Six, nine, ten, eleven. Despite a reasonable catch of five herring and 11 pollock, fishing isn't living up to Arwell's expectations. In terms of time spent and effort you know, put out, I would argue that it isn't really worth it. Uh, and I will be honest, I'm still not convinced on fishing. It's a lot of effort with very little gain. Jury's out. It might not be what he wanted, but every fish adds to the haul for the fishmonger's visit. Can I help? Yeah, you want to have a go? And that means more work for the women. Right then, so... I'm going in. From his bum to his brains. Bum to his brains. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, fish. They know that once gutted, the pollock will be worth more money. Come on, girls. <laughs> You're a pro. With the day's fishing over, Arwell's working on a new project. So what I'm making here is a love spoon. Uh, pretty traditional gift of love in Wales. He's carving a present for his partner, Kate. I bet she thinks I'm just mucking about doing my own thing. Uh, but little does she know that this is a gift for her. I think it'll be a nice surprise for her, actually. After three weeks, Gavin's also settled into life on the island. When you're done that, you're going to come in for a cup of tea? Yep. Have a break? Yep. Even if the work of a 1900 fisherman is unrelenting. There's always something, always something. And even if I'm going fishing or just knocking about outside, even though my shoes are in bits, I've got to find time to polish my boots. There's just always something to do. We'll be able to say, won't we, back in the day, we had it hard. Yeah. We'll do that. When we lived in 1900. That was proper draft. There's no rest for the wicked. Next door in the John's house, Arwell's finished his love spoon. Oh, two in your name, then. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, two should you name there? Oh, what a lovely. Oh. 
The Welsh have been giving love spoons for over 350 years, and traditionally, they represent a contract of marriage. <laughs> Lydia's had a busy day, but the shop she runs from her front room is still open for business. A leak and a cat rat. You can have them, OK, for the half. OK. All right? Yeah, if, if it's more, I, have, I can bring some more. No, 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 that's fine. Okay. It's fine. You take them. All right. For two-year-old Griff, his day is definitely done. OK. This shop is never shut, is it, love? It doesn't feel like it. First really? thing in the morning, last yeah. thing at night. Open all hours. The shop is open all hours. <laughs> It's a beautiful dawn over Llanwyn Island. This afternoon, the fishmonger's coming to buy the latest catch and fill the family's coffers. But first, there's a cause for celebration. How are you? Yeah. Well, a fine morning. Very good. The families are all gathering in the boat shed to help launch the new dinghy that Shipwright Joe and Yannick have been building over the past weeks. Perfect day for the maiden voyage. I'm really excited and uh, hopefully we're going to be able to sail off into the sunrise. We just have to stroke it, don't we? Yeah. Look at that. Stroke it. <laughs> See, what is it? Oh, it's gorgeous. The smell of it is up. Mm. It's lovely, yeah. That's Yannick's, Yannick's work, that. All these are Yannick's work. She's got lovely lines, I always say. She does. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you're right. You're supposed to have a hole in the bottom. OK, Clay? Yep, yep. The dinghy will give the families more opportunity to catch and earn. OK, guys, who's coming with me? Me! OK, would you? Joe's taking the children for a spin. It's a chance for the next generation to start learning the ropes. Okay, Joe. Dav, just hold on tight, OK? You hold on tight and listen to Joe. You OK in the front? Is it good? Yeah. Are we leaking? We're not leaking, guys. She looks really nice in the water. The oars are still holding out. That's good. <laughs> but yeah, it looks really nice. We're going to go around in a few circles. Why? Well, we can't just keep on going out to sea. OK, ladies. And it's not just the youngest members of the community who are getting their first boat trip. <laughs> Natalie and Lydia are heading out with Mickey. Here we go. This could be quite entertaining. <laughs> For centuries, women weren't generally allowed to work on sailing boats, but there's evidence that they did fish close to shore from dinghies. Are you off now, Mickey? Well, we're going to check some lobster pots on it. I'm feeling a bit queasy already. Oh, don't. Don't be sick. Please don't be sick. With spirits running high, Yannick and Gavin want to see how the new dinghy fares as a fishing boat. I've got the back. If you go on the back, yeah. Who's the heaviest? This is my first time. Is it? Yeah. You're a boat virgin. <laughs> no, you know, not it, for mate. long. Seems to lower that over the edge then. Oh. Down it goes. That's lovely. We're fishing for sharks today. <laughs> Hopefully get a big one. <laughs> I don't want any blood on this boat. <laughs> I can't guarantee that, Joe. <laughs> There's a big one in the middle here. Yeah. Keep on all of that end to that. Because Lydia needs to catch up with this end. Okay. As the families row out around the island, another new boat looms on the horizon. A huge steam powered trawler. Wow. The size yeah. of that. Wow. 
The first steam fishing boats appeared in the 1870s, and from the start of the 20th century, they began to dominate the seas. Gareth, have you seen this? Come and have a look. In the Welsh port of Milford Haven, 60 steam trawlers were built between 1905 and 1912. Can't stop progress, can you? It meant the beginning of the end for traditional sail-powered working boats and for small fishing communities around the British coastline. It's a big man squeezing out a little man, basically. Imagine you all those fellas out here doing this and that turns up. You know your days are numbered, don't you? How do you compete with that? Well, there you can. As the demand for fish from growing urban populations grew rapidly at the start of the 20th century, powerful steam trawlers quickly took over our fishing fleets. They can go three, four days at a time, carry ice, scoop everything out of the seas. They haven't got to worry about the state of the wind, the direction of the wind. They just yeah. go... The steamship did come in really close. I mean, it's just absolutely massive. There's no way you can beat with that. It's sad, cos this is just a gorgeous way of life. It's lovely. So when that turned up, it you just felt... I felt so small. Yeah. No competition. As smaller fishing communities started to die out, families had to move on, often heading to larger harbours or into new occupations altogether. I mean, even for us here now, today, it felt like an intruder. Mm. Yeah. So you can imagine, for the people back in the day, when that's the first time they set eyes on a, on a big steam-powered boat... It would have felt very threatening. Yeah, I think so. It definitely feels like the, the death of the small-timer, mm. which I think is, is sad to, to lose that, that way of life. Although the future's looking less certain, the families are optimistic that their biggest catch to date will bring in a valuable cash injection. Thank you. Hello, Griff. What's in your mouth? Oh, no. That's my sandwich. Can I have it? Do you know what we're going to do today? No. We're going to sell all those fish. No. And we're going to have lots of money. And then we're going to get sausages. Sausages. Do you like sausages? Yeah. <laughs> Mike, the fishmonger from the nearby town of Carnarvon, has arrived to see what's for sale. Hello, Mr. Head. Hello, Hello there. How are you? You OK? All right, thank you. Thank you so much yep. for coming out this afternoon. Yes, yeah, really a bit appreciated. blustery. It's the men have had a good catch. Oh, good, good. As usual, the women are in charge of the negotiation. We've got 85 herring. We've got 10 mackerel. Mommy, we've got one large husk here. Uh, the husk isn't worth anything. The husk isn't worth no, a thing. No, really? really. So you don't bother with that at all? No, no. OK. And we've got six skate, uh, wings. skate wings. How much now for these skate wings? A penny a wing, yeah. A penny a wing. Oh, wow. Oh. It looks like the sale isn't going their way, despite all the days of hard work and effort the communities put into the catch. So there's lovely, lovely sized mackerel, ten of those. Well, there's some small ones. There's there. a couple of small, mainly mainly good size though. And then look lovely size on the herring. So five at tuppence. Yeah. And there's six for them then each, like last time. Four and a half. Prices fall in. Yeah. Really? Fish prices have always fluctuated, making fishermen's lives precarious. But at the start of the 20th century, as steam power and mechanisation took over the fishing industry, prices began to drop massively. So we've got 34 okay. pennies for the mackerel. Mm -hmm. 34 pence for the... 34 80... pence for the mackerel? Yeah. The... 85 okay. pennies for the... 85 herring. for the herring. Despite it being their largest catch to date, they've only made nine shillings and 11 pennies, the lowest price yet, 
It represents a shocking 30% drop in value. Can I ask you, how's the price of mussels at the moment? Well, if I was you, I'd go for the cockles more than the mussels. Really? Okay. Really? Okay, that's fine. Interesting. We'll give you penny a pound for them as they are. Penny Pe a pound? Is yeah. that the going rate? Yeah. Well, would you prefer us to cook them? You can cook them if you like. The price will go up, but... I don't know, you know, the price goes it's going up every day. The cockles are going up and the um and the fish are going down, are they? Yeah. Oh, just okay. okay. The average wage for a fisherman at the start of the 20th century was 55 pennies per day. But after splitting the cash. That's allowing three shares, two for the boat, one for Mickey, the fisherman, yeah. and one share for each family. They've only made a poultry. 17 pennies each, the equivalent of £5.50 in today's money. I thought we might have got more. Yeah, I think we would have got more for the fish. Yeah. It's a bitter blow. The price of the fish has obviously come down. Yeah, a bit disappointing. Yeah. And the last thing the 1900 families were expecting. It does make you think, though, hey, as women, it's going to fall more and more on us with cockles. I was almost heartbroken by it because we, well, yeah. we put yeah. such effort into it. Mm. But it feels very much like we've lost control of our own destinies. We're being yeah. dictated to by mm. the rest of the world. We were massively shocked with the price of fish. We thought, oh, we're in for a brilliant week this week. We'll be able to order, you know, plenty of food. We won't struggle at all this week. And it's just, it's gone like that. It's just nothing. It's it's not worth it. Everything you do here already is hard work. And to just get paid a pittance for it, it's just it's just heartbreaking, it really is. And how much have we brought in from that catch, which was three days of fishing? Barely two shillings. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it was very disappointing. Especially considering the work we put into it. All the families have relied on secondary incomes to get them through lean times. For Kate and Arwell, it's been selling eggs, which has often proved more reliable than fishing. The other disadvantage of the fishing is that however much you take, it gets split between a great number of people. The boat and the skipper take a share each. Mm. But, yeah, but, but to be honest, I mean, from day one, I've, I've been worried that whether fishing is sustainable. Yeah? Well, not sustainable in terms of number of fish, but is it, is it the amount of time and effort involved in prepping the, the gear to go out? When uh, that cargo vessel came in a couple of weeks ago mm. and saw the amount of money flying around was more than we've had today, was it? Yep. What are you proposing? Giving up fishing finding something else to do. As a business and a way of life, it's not paying for itself. No. A new day dawns over Llanwyn. Yesterday's crash in fish prices has hit home and they've decided to heed the fishmonger's advice. Hey, guys. Ready? The men are breaking with tradition to help their wives collect shellfish. Do you want carry on, Yeah, yeah, no, no. Can I just get my... While fish prices are plummeting, the value of cockles is soaring. Ready? Yeah, set off. Right, kind of dobbin. After the exertion of last week's three-day fishing trip, Clive's gout has flared up again. He's staying behind to keep the home fires burning. All right, that's all, all the neighbours sorted. <laughs> the group are heading out on a ten-mile round trip, off the tidal island and along the coast. Arlanamore, 
Akadipura. Okay. After two hours, they're nearly there. I'm going that way. Right See you later. Okay. We'll be lots. Yeah. Yeah, give us a shout if you yeah. guys are finished early. Don't mind stopping. Okay. Have yeah. fun then. Bye, best of luck. Hope it goes well. See you later. Yeah. The men are heading off to harvest mussels, while the women are hoping for success in one of the area's largest cockle beds. Kate, Natalie, Lydia and Cheryl have been cockling before, but with mixed results. Well, perhaps we'll do better on this edge. You never know. This time, they've got to deliver. We've got a few good sayings in Welsh. One of them is Amser Torchi Llewis. It's time to get your sleeves dirty. <laughs> One cockle. They're looking for the small shellfish that live in the sand, filtering nutrients from the seawater. They've been a rich source of food for coastal dwellers since pre-Roman times. Now, these are all spent. Nothing. <laughs> but with nearly one square mile of cockle bed to dig in, finding them is a skill. Oh! Oh! Now, that's empty. That one's a good one. One! Woo! <laughs> Pull the seaweed away, you'll find loads more. Oh, all right, OK. They're not on the surface. Most of them are just under, like maybe slightly submerged in the sand as well. OK. Just along the coast, Arwell seems to have got the hang of collecting mussels. It's easy pickings once you know what to look for. And the mussels tend to have this little, uh, I think it's called a beard. You see a little thing there sticking out, which they use to cling on to other rocks and seaweed and bits of bobs. So I've been here for 10 or so minutes so far, and I've already got that much. So, yeah, it's fairly, fairly straightforward, really, and I should imagine I'll fill this sack in, in, in certainly less than an hour, if not sooner. But harvesting mussels... This is like litter picking. ..isn't for everyone. First time since I've been here, it's the first time I'm going to say I'd rather be somewhere else. It's the most boring, tedious thing I've done since I've arrived. There's a million other things I'd rather be doing. On top of that list is fishing. From going from being that sort of heroic fisherman figure to having to scrape around doing what was to them, rightly or wrongly, a woman's work, must have been demoralising. And then from there on in, they're probably living in fear that their livelihood's gone or their lives are going to change forever. Most of all, your pride takes a kick in and you're living in fear. I just don't know how long a working fisherman would have done this for before he cracked and went to work on some docks or on part of a bigger boat. I ain't doing this. I'm completely the other way around. This is the first time in days that I've actually felt useful and productive that I'm doing something, not just waiting around for the weather to change. Hey, there's another sack over here. Fill your boots. No, oh, happily. He's not happy at all, though, is he? You can just tell from his posture. He's, he's not enjoying this. There's not the same adrenaline rush in muscling, is there? Well, no. <laughs> This really is. It's hard work. The women are having to head further out onto the mud-covered flats in search of cockles. It's muddy, it stinks. It's getting harder and deeper. I don't like this sludge. <laughs> I think we might sink. I'm not sure how, mu how much of a good idea this is. I can't get my foot out. Don't, 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 don't pull me, don't pull me. Don't on me. I can't get my foot out. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get out. Hang on, hang on. Give us your leg. <laughs> <laughs> I can't... <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
sorry, Natalie. I really shouldn't laugh. <laughs> Girls? Yeah? I think it's a good spot. Yeah, there are some just resting on top. Yeah. There are patches where, when you hit them, you get some really nice, big, juicy cockles like that one. Finally, after an hour of scraping around, the women have hit the jackpot. I'm not going to lie, I can think of easier ways to make a living. How's it here? Good. In the 1900s, a rich cockle bed like this one would have delivered high earnings for the cockle pickers. Today, due to overfishing, there's a strict quota of five kilos per person per day. I wonder how long we've got before the tide comes in. What do you think, Lydia? Oh, you reckon maybe at least another hour? Oh, really? Yeah. OK, let's get on with it then. <laughs> Gav? Yes, Squire. Look at the size of my muscle. Wow. That's the, that's the biggest one of the day. Back at the muscle bed, Gavin's spirits are lifting. I think what's great is we've just hit on a magic patch of really big muscles, so we're literally just picking them up and chucking them in. So while it felt boring and tedious before, I'm now starting to get a little bit excited at how much money we could make from this venture. I just feel like I'm getting into the swing of it, Chair. Yeah, do you want to be out here in the dark? No. No, then come home, please. Okay. <laughs> yes, Ma. Come on. Mummy's telling you now. Yes, Ma. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. How the hell are we going to carry that there? Bloody hell. You got it? Yeah. You sure? I think the girls are on the way back. OK. Rough. Wet feet, cold hands, heavy backpack, but we got a good haul. It will be another two days hard preparation before the shellfish are ready for sale. That's a lot of cockles. Mm. The next day, and while the younger children are practising their singing in school, Ruby, whose education would have been over by the age of 12, is having a more practical lesson. Have you ever used a sewing machine like this before? No. OK. Modern-day university lecturer Kate is showing Ruby how to sew, a skill all working-class girls would have been expected to know. So. Back here, there's a little lever that lifts that foot up and down. In the 1900s, a young woman such as Ruby would have had virtually no chance of pursuing a career like Kate's. You can do whatever punch you like. And that's it. And keep that turning at a nice, steady, constant pace. So boom, 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 boom. Good, you got it. What sort of career opportunities do you think were available to women and girls? Well, it depends. Like, if we were in a city or something, there was work for women, but it wasn't necessarily great, you know. It was uh, 16 hours in a factory for, you know, nothing. Yeah. One thing I have got here, which you might be interested in, is The Human Woman by Lady Grove. And it's an exciting book for women. I think for your generation, a lot of what she says is really yeah. important. The Human Woman was a collection of essays that highlighted the many inequalities suffered by women. From pay differences to the lack of the vote, it helped fuel the suffrage movement at the beginning of the 20th century. I'm excited to read it. Yeah, Finally, good. I've got something to read. We've got, like, household guides and everything at home, and, like, how a woman should do things. I'm like, oh, I want something interesting. Yeah, well, this is pretty radical yeah. compared to that. Material like this often found its way into even the smallest and most remote communities through local campaigners. Two doors up, Cheryl and Lydia are cooking the cleaned cockles, ready for shelling. When they're cooked, they sell by the pint, which I'm measuring here into a pint mug. 
They'll fetch a higher price when they're sold, ready to eat. Six or seven pints we got now? We're on six. This is number seven. Oh, well, it's good, isn't it? Cockles have been a popular street food since pre-Victorian times, typically served with vinegar. It might not be a good idea for me to help, you know, because I might just eat them all. This is how I like them, just fresh. Wait, wait some. Mm. Nice and sweet, don't they? Uh -huh. I'd better test that one. OK. Mmm, that one's clean as well. Oh, I'd better test that one too. I'm sure that, I'm sure these are the ones I picked. Oh, yeah! <laughs> Mm. Oi. <laughs> Me and Kate had a little discussion, and she gave him this book by Lady Grove called The Human Woman. Okay. Which is a book about the differences between men and women, from the differences of pay. Mm -hmm. She even complains about um, how women aren't allowed to go and work in the mines. It's just facts as it was. So the difference in the wages <clears throat> of a teacher, the master's salary was £135 a year. For the mistresses, same work, same amount of time, 90 For no reason. And we're nearly 120 years on from what the life that we're living at the moment, mm. and we're st it's still a topic of conversation. It's still something that women are fighting mm. for. That's just ludicrous, that. Why? Does he get paid more and I want them to list all the reasons why? Instead of just going, OK, you're a woman, you get there. That's I want them to explain to me why I should get there. That, that's the horrible thing, is that in your position, coming from this kind of community, being really the working class and on the poverty line, that they would just laugh at you as a woman. Mm. They wouldn't even entertain the thought of explaining it to you. Yeah. You'd just be getting above your station and they'd probably just sack you. I sadly. prefer to lose my job than work for someone who... But that, that was the trap, though, because you lost your job and then... You would have you, had a bad reputation stricken. as well. Bad reputation, no money, could end up in a workhouse. It's yeah. a vicious circle to be in. Mm. It was really pathetic, to be honest. And it still is today, like, equal pay. Really gets on my nerves. Why? Like, ah. You know, it's been over 100 years that women have actually had the vote. And it's still, certain things are unequal. Yeah. Yeah. Look at those. The cockle preparation is finished. And Lydia's keen to share her tasty treat. Gav, try one. No, no chance. Are you serious? Go yeah, on, yeah. you won't yeah. even try one. No, Look, if, I, if you dip it in vinegar, you'll just. If you taste sweet with vinegar, they're oh, sweet because they're nice and fresh. Yeah, okay. sell it, you dipped it in vinegar. <laughs> I tell you Cockles now. are still a popular snack in parts of Wales, especially along the coast, but Gavin isn't convinced. Don't look at it, just eat it. No, look at it. <laughs> what if that crunch? Oh, you've had a dirty one. Oh. See? It doesn't get any better, does it? Have one of these, guys. It's got soil or sand in it. Rubes, go on. No, no chance. What's the soil? We're not going to gaggle. It's so soft. Go on, Jude. You're good. It's nearly exactly like Chris. Do you like them? Today, our once thriving UK cockle industry is now mainly selling to overseas markets. But it's still worth an estimated £20 million a year. He won't starve. <laughs> ah! Kate and Arwell have been living as a traditional 1900s fisherman and fishwife for over three weeks now. Fishing hasn't grabbed me at all, to be honest with you. Uh, it seems like a lot of work for very little reward. To rely on something that's out of my control, I'm finding quite difficult to deal with, really. Why am I, you know, stretching my guts on the beach, preparing nets, preparing long lines, baiting, waiting for the weather, check the nets, check the pots, waiting for the weather, waiting for the weather, go out, set the, set the nets out and get one fish. What's the point? It's not for me. Not for me at all. It's always the small guy that's pushed out. As smaller coastal communities started to break up, 
People moved to where the work was, in towns and cities, but also abroad to Commonwealth countries like Australia and Canada. There were lots of people who went from Wales and pursued those opportunities in, in my family and, and, in, and in Adwell's as well. It's difficult to see the future here, knowing as we do that industrialization of the fishing fleets is coming in. It's a shame and a sad time for communities like this. There's a bowl for you to lick. Just on the side, there's cake mix. How's that, Arlo? Is it good? Yeah. Yeah. With the cockles done, the mussels which have been soaking for the past 36 hours need preparing for the fishmonger's visit tomorrow. I like it when we do something all together. I like to do the because then you've got to sit down and kind of relax and yeah. just chat. Despite it being a slow process... We've got to clean them all first, haven't we? It's worth it for the extra money the fishmonger will pay. Everybody's doing it now, aren't they? Yeah. Can, can... The whole kit, well, it's a community thing, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Because we all need the money, <laughs> so we're all having to do them. It's a special little community, this. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Adwell and I have got some news for all of you, actually. Oh. Don't we, boy? This is actually our last day. Oh! No way. We're going to be leaving the island before high tide. Today? Today. Oh. Industrial mechanisation is starting to impact, mirroring the fracturing of small coastal communities at the time. Kate and Arwell, who are child-free and the most mobile, have decided to leave Llanwyn. It was a real shock hearing that Kate and Arwell are leaving. I just wasn't expecting it at all. It's a real shame. It makes you think how fragile a community is if uh, it starts to break up and then just disappears. So you leave tonight? Tonight, yeah, well, before, before the, tide, comes before in, the yeah. tide cuts us off, yeah. It's the beginning of the end. It's sad news. Yeah. And the community will feel different, especially waking up in the morning and not seeing them walking out their door. With regards to the takings on the mussels, I mean, we would appreciate if you could send our share on. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Dear. Such a horrible feeling, and it, like, just rocks you, doesn't it? And that's how it would have been. You know, they would have all grown up together. And all of a sudden, that's just, it's going. It feels like telling your family you're moving home, you know, and, and leaving home. It's really odd. In in 1900s, being the first people to do this would have felt a, bit, a little bit like the people pulling the plug on something far greater than themselves as well. You know, there's not a big community here. And one family moving has a significant effect. It's such a shame that people had to make these decisions. Their whole world views were lived in this little square mile. And, um, and to turn your back on that is... Um, yeah, I still, still can't quite comprehend that, to be honest. It feels very strange, doesn't it? Mm. It does like, feel like we're leaving something behind that we've been part of for longer than a month. It's quite odd in that sense. I should go on a bit, I suppose. It wasn't just fishing communities that were affected by the far-reaching sweep of progress. By 1910, the global boom in industrialization and mass production was affecting many small businesses. My family on my mother's side, the Darnells. They were shoemakers uh, and even had a factory in London, mm. Darnell Shoes, right in the city centre of London. 
And just because everything took off, industry-wise, new technologies, they were pushed out. And then they all moved out of shoemaking completely, moved to Liverpool, to the docks. So the shoe business, which was a way of life for generations, my family yes. collapsed because of industry, and they moved to Liverpool mm. in, in about 19... You see how this is going, It was about we? 1901, 1902. That feels really odd. It feels a bit wrong, if I'm honest. It makes you think, you know, this will come to an end for all of us. No. I don't really want to face that thought yet. Oh, best of luck. Best of luck. Thank you. Good luck in your new. I'm really sad that it's all got a, it's all got to change now, and I don't want it to. I want it to stay the same. I like it how it is. Oh, you know. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> now I'm getting the <laughs> Bye, Kate. Oh. Take care of yourself. Eh? Thank you. Say bye. Oh, now he's shy. Good luck. Good luck, both of you. Bye. 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 Saying goodbye to Cheryl felt like saying goodbye to my mum. <laughs> it really did. In their modern lives, Kate and Arwell are planning on moving from Kate's house in Swansea to take over Arwell's family farm in Pembrokeshire. And as we were walking away, I said, this, this is our end now, isn't it? This is actually our end. Uh. Oh, no, By 1914, many small communities around the British coast had disappeared as our nation's fishing fleets changed forever. It's a new day for the three remaining families on Llanwyn. For Ruby and Natalie, stepping into Kate and Arwell's empty house, it's a glimpse into the future for their own house. Do you know, it feels really big now. Yeah, it's really weird. It's like that homeliness is gone, isn't it, now that yeah. I'm here? It doesn't feel like it was Kate and Adwell's home. It, it feels it's like the heart's like... gone out of it, hasn't it? Yeah. It's like that warmth that's in it. And it's just a shell now. It feels just cold. Oh, oh don't! You don't want to leave our little house. It's fine. Why did you come back here? <clears throat> I think it just seeing all this empty. This is how all our houses are going to be at the moment. They're like they're full of life. The kids are running in and out of every house, and they're lived in. They're lived in and they're loved, you know. And in a couple of days, this is how ours is going to be. Imagine living here your entire life and then having to go. It's like ghosts and like memories, and it's just going to be silent. For one last time, Mike the fishmonger is coming to buy their catch. Hello, fishmonger. Hello, sir. How are you? How are you? Very well, thank good, you. Are you? Good, good, yes. Jolly good. These really are oh, the nice, best aren't quality. They? Look how plump they are. Would you like to try one? Yes, I'll try a couple of them. Very tasty. Good, aren't they? But they're very really nice. They're really good, aren't they? Yeah, really yeah. plump. Yep. The community have mussels, 
But you've got three large sacks and two of the slightly smaller ones. And eight pints of cooked cockles to sell. Six pennies a pint. What do you think, girls? Let's go to seven today. Seven. 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 OK. The cockles have sold for 56 pennies. But how much for the mussels? Make it 28 and we've got a deal. Well, call it 28. 28. 28. Okay. Call it 28. Yeah. Supporting the little man. They've made 32 shillings and 8 pennies, the equivalent of £128 in today's money. It's their best sale ever, and none of it from actual fishing. Once again, Cheryl, pleasure to do business pleasure with you. Pleasure doing business with you, Mr yeah. Hurd. And all, all of you. Best. Very, very honest client. gentleman. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Four and a half. But gathering shellfish was not a sustainable sole income for many coastal communities. And with steam trawlers starting to take over, the future was bleak. For our modern-day families and their helpers, this is their last night on the island. Tomorrow, they'll be heading back to the modern world. Oh, wow! Whoa. What's the party like? Look at it! Tonight, they can enjoy their final few hours, coming together in the boat shed to celebrate their experience as a fishing community at the onset of the 20th century. All the families came to Llanwyn Island with hopes and dreams for their 1900 lives. For the Davis family, it's been about proving that they can get through tough times. I'm doing bread for everyone, so we can do bacon and sausage butties when we get back. Be nice, do not it? We'll all have a little drink at ours. For the powers, it was to create a sense of community. It's been a funny old day. Oh, it has been a funny old day. We all mixed emotions. And for the Barkers, it's been a chance to share their years of knowledge and skills. I have a few words to say this evening. No matter what walk of life you come from, no matter your age or your beliefs, people can come together and build loving communities, and we've found our greatest here. Also, I'd like to mention Mickey. Mickey gave us courage to be fishermen, but most of all, he became our leader. Thank you very much, Joe Howard. OK, we also have our fishmonger. You tight old son. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a pleasure to do business with you. And most importantly, I'd like to remember the fishing communities who we represented. May their courage and their bravery and their history never be forgotten. Yeah. So for one last time, tight lines. Tight lines. Tight lines. Fancy dance. It's the final morning for the remaining three families who have spent the past month living on the wild tidal island of Llanwyn. Yeah, now's the time to say goodbye, isn't it? <laughs> it is sad, and we certainly will miss the children running around, um, and we'll miss the other families, won't we? Yeah. Yeah, there, there, is, there is sadness. It's. Um... Yeah, they're lovely children. Oh, you <laughs> upset. <laughs> oh, we're at the time of our life here, we love. Yeah. Because it really, mm -hmm. it feels like we're leaving our home. And I know that sounds silly. Yeah. We never did sell many of those brushes, did we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
we've done nothing more really than scratch the surface of the lives that these families led. It's been a huge privilege. Whatever happens, we, we will always be this fishing family. Yeah. Whatever happens, this will always, this will always be us. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to go anywhere. I want to carry on fishing. When the families arrived four weeks ago, Storm Alley ushered them onto this remote island. Now, as they leave, another autumn storm, Storm Callum, is chasing them home again. One last look. It was really sad. Really sorry. OK, off we go then. Yeah. Oh, dear. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye. OK. Hoi fawr, ti. Hoi fawr, ti. Well, never forget all this, OK? We won't. Goodbye, Davis House. This has become normality in a very short space of time. Yeah. I've worked harder here than I think anywhere I've, I've ever worked. Um, it's been really, really tough. But it's far more rewarding than mm. anything I've ever done work-wise. Yeah. There is so much to do just to basically to survive. So, yeah, they, they had it very, very tough, and for really, for a pittance. Having experienced a, a taste of that, I think um, it does give me a great appreciation of the life that I have yeah. in the 21st century. Yeah, definitely. And the safety nets that we have as well. Um, I, I think the hopes and dreams for the working man and his sons are whatever they wanted them to be. For Natalie and my daughters, that didn't exist. It's that blunt. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that is a liberty of the 21st century. You can achieve anything you yeah. want. From this experience, I will take, make me appreciate what we've got today, modern day, and what they had in 1900. I mean, it's a world, worlds and worlds apart, really. I think, above all, there's been real peace here, a peace that's almost, I'm loath to say, unobtainable in the modern world. But in the modern world, you've got to fight for that peace. And along the way, my confidence has grown. It made me realise that I'm an OK person and I can get through tricky times. I think I did lose Natalie along the way. Well, you're back now, kid. I keep thinking about the lights will grow dim in the house, the candles will go out, and the stove will grow cold. <laughs> this is my house. <laughs> mm -hmm. I feel like I'm leaving a little part of my heart here. Okay, for the record, I still hate fish. <laughs> <laughs>